Good evening and welcome to the June 6, 2016 meeting of the Town of Scarborough Planning Board. Would you please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. <coughs> Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Karen, can you please take the roll? Ms. Saunders? Mr. Bealey? Here. Ms. Oglis? Here. Mr. Fellows? Here. Mr. Mazur? Mr. McGee? And Mr. Wood? Here. Thank you. And uh, everyone will be voting this evening. Uh, before we move on, a quick housekeeping note. Uh, there was a bit of a, a clerical switch up. So if anyone is here for the Zoning Board of Appeals meeting, that's actually going to be on Wednesday at 7. Uh, there was notice that went out that incorrectly stated this time slot, so I just wanted to make sure got that out there. Um, next item is approval of minutes from the May 16th, 2016 meeting. Move approval, Mr. Chairman. Second. 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 All in favor? Should be unanimous. Thank you. I would like to say something, however. We have great minutes. Okay. I just want to say that I'm proud of our members. I, I agree. They're, wo they're wonderful. Let it be noted. Uh, first action item, Maine Seafood Ventures LLC requests an amended site plan review for 240-350 Pine Point Road, Assessor's Map, R88, Lot 8. Okay? Sure. Um, let's see, some board members will probably remember this item. It was actually before you back in, I believe it was early April. Mm -hmm. The applicants were before you to add a loading dock at that time. And at that time, they sort of gave a heads up that they'd be interested in potentially expanding their loading dock. However, the expansion that they're looking for um, today, this was, I believe it's about a 24 by 15 expansion required Board of Appeals action prior to uh, board action uh, because it, it um, required a variance for setback relief. The applicants did go before the Board of Appeals and received approval um, for the location. So at this time is before this board, again as it was two months ago for a site plan review and consideration of the Shoreland Zone TBC4 standards. Uh, where the board really spent a lot of time on the, on the original expansion. Staff didn't have much left in our comments other than really to note two things. Again, um, and as we talked about before, the TBC4 does require any site plan, any action, um, any property that requires action through site plan approval um, to uh, bring its parking into conformance unless the board finds that there's no practical alternative on the site. Um, in the TDC4 park, to, it's supposed to be to the side or rear of a building. Um, however, the board did previously find that given the site characteristics that was impractical and is likely to find the same on this, the board did so inclined, but did at least want to bring that to your attention that it's something we need to at least discuss and make a, a waiver of. And then really the only other item staff noted as part of our site plan review is with the original approval, there was a stockade fence that the board had sought um, the applicant to install to screen the new loading dock. And just looking through the details of the plans, it doesn't appear that there's any plan to relocate that, um, that fencing. Um, and so that's probably something the board may want to uh, re-engage. So with that, Mr. Chair, I'll turn it back to you. Thanks, Jay. And before I turn it over to the applicant, I neglected to mention one other housekeeping item. Um, number five on the agenda, Larry Scarborough, Inc., 10 Southgate Road, was tabled at the request of the applicant, so we will not be hearing that one tonight. And with that, I'll turn it over to Lee. Great. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, members of the board. My name is Lee Allen with Northeast Civil Solutions, uh, here tonight to present the further expansion of the loading dock. As Jay mentioned, we are here in April and prove basically two bays of the loading dock were here for the third bay, which due to the characteristics of the marsh and what's de um, designated as coastal wetland, um, kind of wraps all the way around our site and there's setback issues to, to where we're going. So we're within that 75 foot setback. That's a shoreland zoning issue of the town. That's why we went to the zoning board. We got an approval to build windside that 75 feet from the zoning board. So we're back before the planning board to follow through on that approval from ZBA looking for that um, additional 24 feet. 
or I should say 15 feet. Um, in regards to the fencing, the stockade fence has been put up since the photos that I have submitted to you. Um, it does block the current um, loading dock. Um, with the addition of this loading dock, with that fence would be relocated. It would basically line up with the fence that covers the uh, um, liquid hydrogen tank that's outside the building. Um, with that, I think we've covered everything and be happy to answer any questions that you would have. Thank you. We, before we turn to board discussion, we have the opportunity for public comment on this. If anyone's <coughs> interested, come on up. Seeing none, we'll go to the board. Roger, would you like to start? Sure. Thank you. Um, I, I happen to um, be down by that area today, and um, I happen to notice the new fencing that went up. Um, and it's quite in contrast to the fencing that's currently around the nitro plant, the, the tank, because it's obviously new. Yeah. You know? Um, just show me where the, the, the additional fencing is going to go there. So, so right now we've built out the fence in yeah. this area. Yeah. This, when this goes in, that fence gets located and it's just extended off. Okay. Um, I, I understand the, the configurations of the site and everything, and you're really limited as to what you can do and everything. The only, the only thing I that seemed to me is that if there was some way of enhancing, doing something with that fencing, either painting it or, or do something to just make it look a little bit more attractive because of, it's really, you know, especially with the contrast between the, 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 the weather, weather fence that's right. around the nitro tank and, and the new fencing now, and it's such a prominent location. Um, I, I, I know it's probably not a requirement, but I just think if you could do anything just to make it appear to be a little bit more attractive, either just painting it all, maybe the same color as the building, in fact. But uh, other than that, I have I have no problems with anything. Thanks, Susan. I have no problems with this. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Mike. I don't have anything to add. That and I'd be in favor of the waiver that they're requesting. Thank, Thank you. you. Likewise, uh, I don't think I have any any other concerns or anything to add. You know, obviously the same constraints relative to parking as existed right. last time still apply. Um, so it goes without saying they, they do, that uh, that's not an issue. Um, and with that, we do have a motion here for consideration, which I would like to put forward. I move to conditionally approve the application of Maine Seafood Ventures for the site plan amendment of property located at 340 Pine Point Road. The approval finds that the proposed building expansion, a 24 by 15 foot loading dock, is consistent with the variance approved by the Board of Appeals within the shoreland overlay relative related to setbacks. Further, I find that the relocation of existing parking spaces in the front yard is impractical due to site characteristics and hereby waive the off-street parking provision of the TVC4 for this application. Conditions of approval, number one. Prior to issuance of a building permit, the applicant shall coordinate a pre-construction meeting with the town engineer. And number two, prior to the issuance of a building permit, the plan set shall be revised to include the fencing detail to screen the proposed loading dock addition. I assume that still applies even though the facts on the ground yeah. have been okay. verified. Yeah. Right. Right. Yes. Okay. Like on the plan. Right. Mm -hmm. Did you just second? Yes, yeah, okay. I did. Any discussion? <laughs> All in favor? Thanks. That's unanimous. Great. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Moving down to item number six. Mike and Linda Johnson request review of a private way extension for Abbey Lane Assessor's Map R21, Lots 2 and 2G, and Assessor's Map R12, Lot 90. Jay? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, let's see, the, so the applicable review criteria that the board's being asked to look at here is the town's private way uh, standards and the street acceptance ordinance. Essentially what is occurring is the applicant is going through, the town has a private way standard that um, typically reviewed through the planning department, more specifically the town engineer, and the intent of that is to be sure that any private development that um, is outside the more regulatory or uh, review of the board uh, subdivision or site plan um, ha goes through the same level or has the same expectation 
uh, for development because the town has adopted these standards because it's understood that over time as residential development occurs off private ways, oftentimes these roads can become public roads. And for issues of maintenance, uh, uh, operations, servability, we want to be sure they're built to a certain standard. As the applicant's been working through the town engineer, there have been two items that have been identified that require a waiver. One is the road width, or I shouldn't say require a waiver, request a waiver. One would be the road width, um, typical expectation is a 24 foot wide road, the applicant's seeking 20. And the other is for a short stretch of roadway ditch depth. Um, and the applicant's seeking to modify that as well. Um, You'll receive staff comments in those regards and generally have been found uh, fairly comfortable with both requests. I will note that there's a segment of Abbey Lane that's existing, was before this board probably four to six years ago, I don't remember the exact date, and the board approved a 20 foot wide road at that time, so they're looking to extend it. Um, the other issue that staff brought is bringing to the board's attention since it's before you, again through our street acceptance standards, there is a provision in there about um, uh, street access to adjoining properties and the language talks about where in the opinion of the planning board it makes sense to provide for uh, um, uh, access to adjoining properties that that should be looked at so we bring that to the board's attention um, as, as staff sort of looked at the proposal of Abbey Lane extension and the existence of CK Lane it looked like there might be an opportunity there um, to at least have a conversation and so we'll bring, we bring that to the board's attention as well. Um, with that, Mr. Chair, I turn it over to you. I'm here to answer questions as we go. Thanks, Jay. And I'll turn it over to you, Nancy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Nancy St. Clair. I'm with St. Clair Associates. I'm here tonight on behalf of Mike and Linda Johnson. The Johnsons are here tonight in the audience. Uh, what we're, we're, as Jay had mentioned, we're here before you in sort of a unique situation, if you will. You don't always see a private way review come before you folks. Uh, but as part of that review, we do uh, seek two waivers. And as Jay mentioned, the first is with regard to the roadway width. Abbey Lane is about 1,250 feet long now, and it's 20 feet wide paved. And as Jay mentioned, back in 2010, uh, the applicants came before the board and asked for a waiver on roadway width at that time. At the time, it was contemplated that there could be up to about eight lots on the road. Uh, right now there are five homes that use Abbey Lane. We are proposing as part of the expansion a additional five and the applicant's existing residence is of such a size that it could be split. So that's the 11 lots uh, that we're discussing. The reason for the change from the 8 to 11 is twofold. One is the applicants have actually acquired the adjacent Bruns property, and you'll see that on the plan here. I'll talk about it in just a moment. But that additional land opened up some additional opportunities for them. The other is that at the time back in 2010, one of the lots that was uh, sold off to another party was actually subsequently split. So now we have 11 lots uh, potentially on this. So as part of our sort of return back to you folks, we wanted to show you that overview plan and give you a bit of a feel for what we're looking at uh, as part of that. So I lost my pointer somewhere in the travel. So hopefully this will work for you. So the lots that are currently accessed by the existing portion of Abbey Lane are in this area here. They're in that sort of yellowish color to kind of Take a step back, Abbey Lane is off of Ferry Road. Ferry Road is along here. It actually continues down to a cul-de-sac and connects into another subdivision that comes out and goes out onto Holmes Road. At the bottom here, you don't see it on this rendering, but we'll get to that in a minute, is Beach Ridge Road. So is what road? Beach. Beach Ridge Road. So as I mentioned, <coughs> Abbey Lane is about 1,250 feet long. These homes are accessing off it. This is the applicant's property here where their home is. So that lot is of sufficient size to be split. So there's potential at some point in the future that one more uh, home could uh, arise on there. In 2010, when the applicants were first before you, their property extended only up to here. So they had this sort of L-shaped land left. Oh, thank you. <laughs> they had this L-shaped land left. And as you can see, this little white area here, that was the um, 
possible extension at that point. So as part of our program moving forward with this additional land, we looked at what might be some opportunities for the applicants to do some divisions of their land in their long-range planning for the future. So here's the same plan, same road extension, but you can see here the outline of the five additional lots that could happen over time uh, in the future. Uh, as Jay mentioned, this is not a subdivision, this is a division amongst uh, the applicant's own properties and will occur as a future planning phase. So as part of that, as you all know, in the RF district, each lot must have, that's not in a subdivision, must have 80,000 square feet of upland area. In addition, all the lots have to have a 25-foot upland buffer, we'll get to that in a minute, as well as a 15-foot building setback from that. So this plan shows all of that information. So we have a parcel here, we have a parcel here, which extends all the way back to this side here. We have this larger piece at the end, we have this parcel <coughs> and that parcel. And as I mentioned, each one of those respects the ability to have at least 80,000 square feet of upland area. We also respect the 25-foot upland buffer. We're not proposing any uh, wetland impacts as part of our extension of Abbey Lane. It comes up through uh, the upland areas themselves. So as I mentioned, the first waiver request that we have is to allow this construction of this extension to reflect the same width of pavement that is on the existing section of Abbey Lane. At the time, the board had contemplated up to eight lots. With this additional land, we're up to 11 lots. The distance from here to here is just under 2,000 feet. So we are at the maximum length that we would be going with a dead end road. Uh, as part of that, but it does provide access to all of the applicant's land. As part of the acquisition of the property from the abutter, Mr. Bruns, they actually also ended up with this piece of land here, and we'll talk a little bit about that when we talk about accessibility. So I wanted to give you folks sort of the general overview of the, the future master plan, if you will, uh, for their properties. So. <coughs> Going back to this plan, the second waiver request that we're asking for occurs right in this area here. There's a wetland finger that comes up into this area here. That 25-foot upland buffer comes at an area that's a fair amount of grade change that comes across here. So we're actually in a cut section through the road. So in order to construct what would be a typical uh, depth of a ditch, we would end up having a couple of different alternatives. The first alternative that we had proposed was to steepen up the back slope and put some riprap on it. And that was not the preferred approach when we went and met with the town staff. So one of the recommendations was we need to consider something else. The purpose of steepening that up was to maintain that 25-foot upland area without having to grade in that location. So one of the things that we did discuss with staff and our uh, proposing to you folks tonight is a short segment of the road ditch section that would actually be shallower than the typical depth and that would be at about six inches. That would allow the normal three to one slope off the edge of the road shoulder down to a six inch ditch and then back up at a two to one slope which is a traditional section grading wise on the slope section. The road in this section is about eight percent. So when, you when you're talking about a shallow ditch but a steep road section, you're ending up with the ability to drain that section through there because uh, flow in the ditch will be moving even though it's relatively shallow. So it's a short segment, it's in that area there, but it is less than the typical dip, ditch <coughs> depth section. I knew I was going to say that. The typical depth of ditch in that section. So the rest of it is normal, uh, but in that particular area we all are also asking for a waiver. So the last item that I wanted to also talk to you folks about is with regard to access to CK Lane. <coughs> so as we received comments um, from staff and had discussions, one of the things that we were asked to look at was 
accessibility, connectivity, those types of things. So we wanted to show this sort of overall graphic for you. So this area in orange is the area that we're talking about with you folks tonight. This area in yellow are the lots that are existing along Abbey Lane. As I mentioned, we're about 2,000 feet from here to the end. This large green area here is the Comstock Farm, which is uh, set aside in conservation. And the Larrabee Farm and the river are obviously on the other side, again, with the conservation and the resource protection areas along the river. So one of the things that, that we had been specifically asked to look at, we, we provided some information showing accessibility to here, that's not going to open up any more developable land. Accessibility down to here with CK Lane was really one of the ones that came back uh, from staff and we've been asked to sort of highlight with you folks tonight. So at first blush, this is a short segment and it makes a loop. Okay, that's, that's, that's good. It's about 450 feet. But we looked at that when we were looking at this property because remember, the applicants also ended up with this land down here which is off the end of CK Lane. Looking at this terrain, looking at the natural resources on the site, looking at the connectivity of trying to do a looped configuration or anything like that, we really ended up constructing a lot of road with a lot of impact to the nicer developable areas on the lot. <coughs> so if you go back, remember the plan, we had two parcels in this area here. And as I mentioned, each one of those has to have 80,000 square feet of upland. They do have a little bit over 80,000 square feet of upland. So in this area here, there's just a little bit more upland area than the minimum necessary to do two lots. But it's about 16 hundredths of an acre. To take and put in a paper street at a 50-foot right-of-way to come through here is half an acre. So we're looking well over the available land area that could be used for that without the loss of a lot. So if there were to be a connection through here, we would end up losing the ability to have a house lot in that location. In addition, we're not gaining any more access to land. <coughs> As a matter of fact, we're building another road about 450 feet long with a wetland crossing with impacts to the resources, no matter whether you put it here, here, or here, you still get to cross to get over to <coughs> connect to CK Lane. And it comes at the expense of a loss of a lot for the applicant. So as we discussed in our application, <coughs> we would uh, be concerned <coughs> that this would have a negative aspect on the applicant's property and not provide any benefit for that. One of the discussions that was had was, well, what if this road became public? As we had noted in our application materials, as the applicant has stated, he has no intention of offering uh, this roadway for public. He likes living on a private way. He intends to live here. And as part of the private way maintenance agreement, any person who purchased a lot on this Abbey Lane would be fully aware that this is a private way. So as part of that, what we wanted to, you know, present to you folks is that although this connectivity may look good on paper, in our opinion, it doesn't provide any tangible benefits. As a matter of fact, it has a lot of detriments uh, for that. These two pieces of property here, this sort of section here and here, that's land owned by the applicant. It's at the end of CK Lane. So the concern about additional development and additional burdens on CK Lane this is the applicant's property. They're not proposing to do anything uh, as part of that. And as you can see graphically, if you look in this sort of whole neighborhood area, this is a typical lot size, this is a typical lot size in the district, in the neighborhood, with a, with a scale of lots, if you will. These are the, the minimum 80,000 square foot upland areas um, for the site. So we're not looking at a vast opportunity to bring new roadway networks, et cetera, to that. So from our standpoint, we respectfully request that uh, you folks consider that we have provided sufficient means of access for the properties and that connectivity to adjacent land 
it's not appropriate in this particular situation. So, there we are. Thank you. Uh, before we move on, this is another item where we have the opportunity for public comment. If there's anyone who would like to come on up to the podium. I don't see any takers. Mike, do you have anything? Um, sure. Well, uh, Nancy, you made a good case for the width, certainly. I mean, <clears throat> I don't think I'd be interested uh, in seeing Abbey Lane widened more so than the current Abbey Lane is. Uh, what is the condition of the current Abbey Lane? Is it a paved? It's paved, yes. Okay, and the new proposed road extension would be paved as well? Okay. Um, and the land that, that tannish color that you've outlined, and you say it is owned by the applicant? Is that is that what shows on our plan as now a formerly Fowler? Right here, yes. It is. Yes. So it, it that's now owned by Johnson. It Linda Fowler Johnson owns. Oh, Johnson. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. All right. Is that a newer transaction or no? I uh, no, it happened all at the same time. Oh, okay. Um, before I um, again, you made a good case about really not extending it to CK, except that. Oftentimes, we're uh, um, uh, given by applicants a uh, argument to do a uh, conservation subdivision to reduce some of the requirements of, on the RF zone as far as lot size, et cetera. Do you have uh, anything to say to that? Was that looked at as a as a way to satisfy our interest in connectivity? We did look at, at a conservation subdivision, and in this particular site, with regard to the topography and the way that the wetlands are configured on the property, just to physically get there and provide accessibility for lots, you didn't really end up with a buildable nice envelope for that. And then you got to remember that all the lots on the existing section of Abbey Lane are the traditional 80,000 square foot RF lots. So you'd end up with sort of a different type of a neighborhood not the feel that the applicants were looking for and certainly not the layout that would provide any tangible benefit to going that route. Okay. Um, is CK, uh, maybe for staff, is CK Lane a private road also? Yes, that's my understanding. If that, is that correctly depicted, uh, Jay, as far as you know? I mean, it doesn't have a turnaround opportunity or a hammerhead? Um, to the best of my knowledge, that's how it's mm. currently. All right, well, I don't have any further questions. I think that uh, you made a good case and nice presentation, and uh, certainly with the um, the road, how it changes in its its profile, I think appears to me, I'm no engineer, but it does appear to me that it would provide adequate drainage. So I'd be uh, comfortable with uh, waiving both the width requirement and the ditch requirement. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Susan? Thank you. Um, I feel the same way in terms of the um, width and in terms of the um, uh, six inch deep roadway ditch. Um, I have to admit I don't understand that, but that's why we have a town engineer. And I really like our town engineer, so I don't see any problems with that. I would like to go to the last paragraph of the um, notes from the um, assistant town planner, which talks about the fact that um, this is about the public uh, or non-public access, future access to, the, to this land. And it says here on the point of roads becoming public, um, is there any reason, I'm asking as a question, that the applicant would not be willing to offer a legally restrictive covenant limiting the future ownership of the road as private, which would alleviate certain concerns that staff has and I personally have related to both construction design elements which are the prefer which are preferred by the town for long-term maintenance. In other words, I understand what you're saying about why the people who, folks who own this land are not interested in doing this, but we're interested here in, in, perp in perpetuity. Thank you, perpetuity. <laughs> <laughs> At my age, I should be able to say that better. Um, so I would like to suggest that that should be part of the um, submission? We have talked a bit with the applicant about that comment mm -hmm. um, and y as you know in the application materials that we filed, I'm sorry. in the application materials that we filed, 
as part of our response to comments. It's been made clear that the applicant has no intention of offering that for public acceptance. They own the roadbed, they control that roadbed, and until such times as they sell that, there would be no opportunity to offer that to the public. And that is even on the assumption that the subsequent owner would want to offer it up for public acceptance. A couple of the items that were raised in the staff review, particularly with regard to maintenance, were some preferential items with regard to public works. They are items that if at the time of street acceptance, if it were ever offered by some subsequent owner, those items could be addressed at that point. And with the applicant not proposing to have it be public and not proposing to turn it over for public acceptance, I'm not sure what the problem is. Why can't we, if that's all true, why can't we just say, no, we're not going to do this? No, we're not going uh, to. Why, why can't we just say that we're going to have a restricted covenant? I mean, there's no intention. This is in perpetuity. I understand what the applicant has in mind, and I have no problems with that whatsoever, and I trust them explicitly, but when they're dead and gone, and I believe that's going to happen to all of us, when they're dead and gone, and why is it a problem to just say, we're just going to say this isn't going to happen? At that point, I guess we could follow up with the applicant and their attorney as okay. to what the Okay, I would appreciate it if that would happen. That. I really would. And if we do a um, recommendation for a pr uh, approving this this evening, I would like to make that a condition, if at all possible. I mean, I understand the rest of the board needs to weigh in on that, but that's something that I'm personally a little concerned about. Thank you. Thank you. Roger? Um, I have no problem with the, um, the two waivers you're requesting. And I think you made the case for the, you know, having no paper street there. I think that makes sense. Uh, so other than that, I don't have any problem with anything. I, I would assume, getting back to what Sue was just talking about, if, the, if this were to ever become a request for a, a public street, that they would have to come through the whole process all over again, wouldn't they? It's a request, it's a council action. <coughs> um, so it would go to council. Yeah. Okay. At that time, you dealt no, with I didn't mean to interrupt, but I, um, we had a very similar situation with, um, I want to say, not Canterbury, but Cranberry. Cranberry, yep. where the, um, the residents on that road wanted the town to accept that, what well, was a private road. And before the town accepted it, um, it had to be brought up to town standards hmm. at a cost to the residents. And I think the town, uh, to make it affordable, I think the town assessed each resident a special assessment each year for X amount of years. So um, I would imagine that would be a, um, a formula for, for any kind of private road that is, is uh, interested in being made public. I just have another, just a curiosity. Sure. Um, and this pertains to all private roads, uh, and it has to do with the maintenance. Um, who's responsible, for instance, snow plowing, and to make sure school buses can get down to these these homes? Private responsibility. So it's quite possible if there's a snowstorm, the school bus cannot get down there. Ms. Chairman, if I might add, there is an existing maintenance agreement already on Abbey Lane. That maintenance agreement will actually be amended to add the additional land, but also the additional requirements for the elements of this new section. There are a couple of uh, level lift spreaders that are out there that require a different type of maintenance that's in that plan. That plan is prepared in accordance with the town's review under the, the private way standards. It, there's a framework for it that's already established with the ordinance for the private way standards. But in addition to that, um, the town engineer will be reviewing our specific elements of it. We've, we've got a maintenance plan already proposed as part of our application materials. So that existing recorded document will be amended to add that new requirement. But that is part of a maintenance plan. The existing section is already maintained under that program. Thank you. Um, as with my fellow board members, I'm, I'm okay with the two waiver requests, um, given all the information that we've seen. Um, and as Susan uh, indicated,
indicated, we, we put a lot of faith in our, our technical uh, <coughs> staff who ultimately have to sign off on these things. So I'm not concerned about the drainage. The width, I think, is pretty straightforward. Um, <coughs> you also, I agree, made a, a good case for not having the paper street connection. I appreciate you walking us through that. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and I just want to say a little more on this question of you know, private roads versus public roads and just sort of reiterate that and hopefully make clear that we're, we're, not, we're absolutely not singling out these applicants and these owners. Um, and it, it wouldn't be on our radar if, it, if, if this sort of thing hadn't, been, hadn't come up in, in practice in the past uh, for the town. And I think, you know, as planners, it's incumbent upon us to look ahead, look beyond uh, circumstances which might arise with future ownership and other and or other circumstances that might change. And as with Susan and others, you know, I absolutely believe that the current owner has no intent of ever uh, seeking to have the town accept the, the, the street. Um, but it is something that we that we always do like to think about and, and at least have a conversation about with applicants because uh, circumstances can change and then it can sometimes be a little bit more challenging down the road, so to speak. Um, that said, um, I, uh, I don't, again, don't think we need to push the, push the issue in terms of requiring a paper street connection or um, anything along those lines. Um, to follow up on what uh, Susan said, uh, it would seem to me that, as you've, you've indicated, um, uh, Nancy, that the, that the owners intend to, not only do they not intend to, to offer the street for, for public acceptance, but um, that they would make clear to any subsequent buyers that it was to remain private. So it would seem to me that by logical extension that a, uh, a covenant would, would be appropriate. So um, I, when I put forward a, a motion here in a moment, I, I will include language along those lines, and certainly the applicant can discuss that with, with their council and if there are any issues, you know, that can be that can be discussed with staff. But it seems to me that that's a that that's sort of a common sense um, resolution to it, if you will. Um, that it's just sort of putting a little more um, a little more meat behind that that intent to to, to see that it stay private in perpetuity. Um, what is, any, if any I could just add sure. one item to that. Um, as you know, we talked about uh, Abbey Lane being about 1,250 feet long. When that 1,250-foot section was built and, and the applicant was before you to receive that waiver on roadway width, the actual roadway at that time was 17 feet wide. So when the applicants received approval, they actually had to widen and pave the existing road, and they had to build that existing section to the applicable standards at that time it was reviewed through uh, the, the uh, engineering office when that extension was built. So the applicants are certainly familiar with the need to provide road upgrades. The issue that has been at hand with this proposed extension is we've come before you folks with the waiver request for the width, we've come before you folks with the waiver request for the depth. The issue that we had sort of a, a bit of a, a challenge with is the stabilization of the ditch line. The stabilization? Stabilization of the ditch line. Okay. We have proposed as part of our plan to put stone, permanent stone check dams every 25 feet, which is an acceptable means of stabilization of the ditches. The remaining section of the ditches would be grassed, which from a maintenance standpoint, there was a request if the public works were to take this over that some other means of stabilization of the ditches be considered. That could be riprap along the entire extent of the ditches or some other permanent means such as what's called turf reinforcement mat, which is very expensive. The installation of the additional riprap along that edge is something that could be added at a later date, but the applicant didn't feel that as a private way that was a necessary additional cost that they were amenable to consider, particularly since it's not their intention to make this public. 
And that's really one of the issues, that, at least in my understanding of the comments, where if this is going to be a public road, that from a maintenance standpoint, public works maintenance of the ditches would have a different surface treatment for that. So that's really where we're at, because the road section, gravel section, just for the ordinance. The width, we come to the slope, the ditch depth, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about an additional initial construction cost that the applicant feasibly would like not to have to encounter. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I think, I don't think any of us are, mm -hmm. are taking issue with any of that, and we, we don't have any, any issue in terms of our policy or, or personal philosophies in ter about having it remain private. I think we just want to make sure that, that, that's, mm -hmm. that that's really sort of codified and made clear um, in legal terms and um, just sort of make sure that it's nice and clean. I don't think I don't think any of us are disputing the, the merits of, of why why the owner would want to want to keep it private. And from our so. perspective on that particular item, because it was a ditch stabilization that could have been a retrofit at the time of offering the street for public acceptance, that that is relatively common, Mr. Wood just noted that with the other properties that there are maintenance issues, there are changes that may have to be made. And so the position was that if at some future date, if some subsequent owner ever chose to offer it for public acceptance, that there may be a, a improvements that need to be made to meet the standards at that time, which could be different. May I? I'm confused. I'm confused. Go ahead. This comes down, I, I may be very wrong. But it seems to me that it comes down to what we are asking is for a restrictive covenant limiting future ownership to private. And that's what we're he talking about here, although we're not saying that. And I don't understand. I think, uh, I think staff may have a... Okay, go ahead. There seems to be an in intersection of two issues coming Please coming explain, to forward. I'm I'm One issue confused. that uh, Ms. St. Clair was just talking about is really about design preferences. Right in the ditch ditch line we have no and problem. the public works director and and um, town engineer you know understand what the applicants trying to do and are generally fine with it provided that it's always going to remain private mm -hmm. it is not something that the town believes is it is the best practice that's just but preference I should say maybe preference is a better way of saying it um, it's not the town's preference so so long as it's going to remain private that's fine the other issue, and, and really where <coughs> planning staff's comments were coming at, was really at the the, the, pa the paper or real street connectivity issue, um, which is really a separate issue about, um, I know Ms. St. Clair had sort of talked about access uh, to other developable lands, but I think there's other issues in terms of, again, this gets to if it's a public or private street, if these should ever become public streets, having the ability to, in the future, connect these two streets, should they become public, would serve, you know, uh, purposes <coughs> not just for access to available lands, but talking about emergency access, serviceability. Uh, someone mentioned the bus being able to make a, you know, more efficient services. So I think in those type of, that's sort of the access which planning staff's comments were referencing. Um, so I think there's sort of two, separate issues going on and um, as, as you'll, you know, saw before you, um, I think staff on both these issues becomes much more comfortable if, as the applicant has already indicated, and we've already talked about quite a bit, they've stated that it's their intent to remain private, um, but again, future owners may have different ideas. If, if there's a way to make it legally binding that remains private, I think, you know, T town engineer, public works, planning staff are completely comfortable. If there's sort of this outstanding issue that future ownership may take a different direction, then, you know, again, at the board's discretion, we, you know, and based on this discussion, does it make sense to maintain at least the paper street connection because the future is, is, a, is an unknown. Um, and so we're not saying that right now is probably the right time to make a street connection. 
Matt, you know, I think staff would generally agree with that. <coughs> preserving that right in the future seems to might have some merit. So, uh, hopefully that helps in some ways. Thank you. And I think what I'm what I've heard from the board and, and where I am on it is that we're okay with the two waivers for the road width and the ditch depth. We're we are not com we're not feeling inclined to require a paper street connection as a condition. But we and I guess we haven't heard explicitly from everyone on the board, but we there seems to be a general consensus or plurality um, looking for this legally binding covenant which would ensure that the private street would remain private in perpetuity. And Mike, we haven't heard from you on that <laughs> specifically. Yeah, uh, well, not specifically, I guess, but um, I, I'm, I'm just not convinced you can actually ensure something will always remain private. No matter what kind of language we put together here or, or later, um, I think it's always the possibility, 5, 10, 15 years from now, someone's going to come along and, and, and <coughs> present, present uh, a request that right. things be reversed. My interest really is that the road is built to a standard that should it come before the town for acceptance, it can be configured to whatever those standards might be at that time. And that can be a little work, could be a lot of work. But at the end of the day, if they follow the same formula that I've seen in the past, it's gonna, the, the cost is going to be burdened by the uh, folks who reside on that street. So I'm not, I'm not overly concerned. As long as it meets <coughs> certain standards today, and it appears that it does. So <coughs> I, don't th I don't think any kind of addendum or uh, covenant or whatever is really, at the end of the day, is really going to matter. I don't see. Yeah. That can be guaranteed. Roger, you had something? Um, I, I tend to agree with Mike on that because, um, I, in other words, if they had the covenant, they, this could never become a public street. Is that is that how that works? I think that was the thought. That was the idea. I mean, I, you can, as Mike said, you, you can. Yeah, see, I can always pursue whatever they wanted to pursue. I, I think as long as it's satisfying the requirements of the town, what the town needs right now, for instance, school buses or whatever else, it, and, and all the, the drainage and all that stuff. Um, I mean, I, it seems to me that if I own the land, I'd like to have that option in the future, maybe to make it, if somebody, if the residents wanted to make it a public street, that they would have that, that choice to do that as long as they would have to bring it up to the town standards at that time. I don't think you could ever take that right away from anyone. I'm sorry. I'm not. I'm not a lawyer, certainly, but it seems to me it it it, it doesn't fit well with me that you could ever say to someone, "Sorry, but you can you cannot propose that this roadway be made uh, be accepted by the town, even even if they met all the requirements of a public street at that time." I don't know how that can be denied. Yeah, I don't. I don't think we'll resolve the legal question here, right, but I mean, right. I, I, you, you can you can prevent a private owner from doing a lot of things. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I do agree that that's potentially. Okay, I want to make one last statement about this, and because it's not that important to me, it's important. I don't see what the problem is. I really don't see what the problem is. <coughs> it's not buildable. Why don't we just say we're going to make it? I don't understand why it's a problem, but I'm just one person and there aren't that many of us this evening, so <laughs> I don't want to get into it. I want to get out of here early, so Mike's there you go. Mike's established so far tonight that he's not an engineer or a lawyer. <laughs> That's right. Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> Whatever. All right. I think we're going to, we, we agree on the things that are most important. Right. And, um... I don't want to get into okay. it any deeper. All so right. I just, so I just want to point out that the language says where in the opinion of the board. Yes. So if the board doesn't find that a connection is needed, you can just move on the waiver request and dispense of the item. If the board right, finds let's, let's that there that. should be a connection made, then you should find, you should make There's an opinion. There's something going on here I don't get. So. Right. I think that's where we are. We took a little bit of a circuitous route to get there. Um, but I appreciate all the... Discussion.
Um, and with that, I would like to uh, make a motion to approve these two proposed street acceptance waivers on road width. Given the existing characteristics of the area's roadway system and development pattern, and based on supporting statements from various town departments, I move to waive the town's standard road width requirement and find the proposed 20-foot roadway design sufficient. Ditch depth. Given the site topography and that the proposed design enables the project to avoid disturbance within the 25-foot wetland setback while maintaining positive drainage, I move to approve the waiver request for a limited six-inch deep roadway ditch located roughly between stations 13 25 and 1425 as may be slightly altered during final design and construction upon approval by the town engineer. And that's the motion. Second. We have a second. Any further discussion? All in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Next item, number seven. Matthew Scott requests site plan amendment review for 237 Gorham Road, Assessor's Map R37, Lot 12. Jay? Yep, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, let's see. As our staff notes indicate, this site received approval from the board in 2012 for the development of a Meineke Car Care Center, which has been up and operational for a number of years. And there's uh, been an additional tenant space. Uh, at this time, there is a tenant <coughs> who wishes to move in. Dave's Dave's World, who wishes to add uh, what's considered by our definition accessory outdoor display. The original site plan from 2012 had a note on there that said no accessory uh, outdoor displays are allowed um, without first getting planning board approval. So the applicant is here before you tonight seeking approval to display some mechanical units that are part of their um, operations, and I'm sure he can give you a much better description of what those are than I. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Jay. And I'll just briefly add, um, as a note of additional context, that this item was initially considered for administrative approval, in which the chair would have had the discretion to, to uh, sign off on it, which is sometimes done for kind of de minimis type I mm -hmm. items. Um, as I considered it as the chair, um, I felt that um, while it probably was not a major issue, given that the board historically has, has given <coughs> a fair amount of scrutiny to outdoor display and that this was sort of an, an odd case in which we have, out, we have mechanical equipment which we, also, which we also tend to focus on, sort of hiding mechanical equipment, which happens to be integral to the use. Um, it just seemed like um, a little bit of a an interesting, more interesting uh, question to me, and I thought we should give the board the opportunity to take a look at it. So thank with you. that, I'll turn over to the applicant. Thank you. Yeah, I want to thank you guys for the opportunity. Um, you guys have done a very good job of keeping this town very beautiful. That was part of the reason we wanted to come here. We are um, we are a uh, Days World Modern Energy Solutions, and uh, what we've been doing is moving from Dober Foxcroft, where I am originally from. We started, uh, that's our mother's store. And then from there, we took the bold approach to come to Southern Maine, which is pretty scary for me, to be honest with you. Uh, being um, from Central Maine, uh, and we had great success in Wyndham. We started off, and you have to excuse um, myself and my ignorance to this, because I, I've never had the opportunity to, to be in this role. Um, typically, in Wyndham, uh, that was uh, we we bounced it off from the town, and they approved it, and they were okay with the mechanical usage out front. But I can completely understand and respect the fact that why I'm here. Uh, we're taking a a product that we typically would love to hide. We actually that's our job when we go to someone's home or businesses. We're actually looking for the place where you do not see this product. Makes sense. <clears throat> but in this situation, I need people to see them because this is what we're selling. Um, the way that we have designed it is to make it attractive where you want to pull in and see what we're doing. Um, heat pumps are becoming very popular and the most efficient way to heating and cooling now. And in order to 
bring people in and to almost a call to action would be to get them to come in and see what's going on. I didn't, I don't have any um, good um, poster boards for you guys, again, being my first time. Um, I do have some pictures that you can see up on the screen. What we'd like to do, um, and the staff had mentioned to me on the larger unit to move it on around to the other side, but that's the complete opposite of what I wanted to do. What I wanted to do was to showcase the wave of what's coming, and that is whole home solutions, where a typical heat pump would be a one-to-one -one situation, one inside unit, one outside unit. Um, but that larger dual, dual fan unit that you see in the picture that was brought up to being um, a slight issue, that is where they're all going now, where we can do up to eight zones with one heat pump. Um, it's an investment piece for people, but it's also um, giving them the opportunity to shut rooms off like lights. So that's the whole idea behind it, is to only be using enough energy to utilize that room as needed. That can only happen from these dual fan units. Um, it also separates Dave's World from the rest of the, the heat pump companies because most of them are just working on the one-to-one -one situations not being the most efficient way of doing it. So there's a niche within the niche, and we'd like to bring that to the people, and we'd like to really showcase that. It is unique um, where I want to showcase something where you're typically hiding, but in this situation, they're not a mechanical device, they're a display, and that is um, that fine line that why we're here today. Um, I'm asking for the trust to make this look good, um, and I also would be up for, once it's all completed, if it was not accepted in the future to revisit it and to change things around. But what I'm looking for is the opportunity to do something that you have not seen before and then also understand that it could be taken away. Okay. Anything else? No, that's it. Thank okay. you very much. Great. Thank you. Um, we do have the opportunity for a public comment if anyone would like to come on up before we turn to board discussion. All right, not seeing anyone. Roger, do you want to sure. jump in? Yeah, okay. This is kind of interesting. Um, I'm kind of curious. Mm -hmm. How are you going to convey to the public that these are, that these are what you're selling and they're just not part of the mechanical units of the building? Lots of marketing. <laughs> um, part of Dave's World's campaign is um, we, we have brought this to – I'm going to back up a little bit. That, that was said to us originally of how we're going to get people to buy these because it's such a, like heat pumps don't work in Maine. Um, one of the things that we're good at is marketing. Um, we have became the largest installers of heat pumps in the United States, both for Mitsubishi and Mitsubishi Electric. We were both recognized for that this last year, um, which is quite a feat coming from Dover Foxcroft being the largest installers of these in the United States. Um, that's the only way we did that was marketing. Um, we are we have several commercials ready to go. Um, we have some filming we want to do. We want to bring people to them, to this location, to see the largest interactive display of heat pumps. We are also bringing in all makes, all the major makes of them. So we don't expect people just to drive by and see that, but we want them to recognize it when they do get to our location, and also to be able to look at them and and uh, literally play with the remotes and see how they work and how they sound. I think it's very important for them to be able to recognize the units as they are trying to find us. So I assume you're going to have some <coughs> signage? On yes. The yeah. Um, to like Meineke only on the other side. Yeah, we wanted to mirror that because of, for the look. We want, the, it's the exact same size sign. Yeah. It'll be Dave's World with our logo, and so it'll say Modern Energy Solutions underneath it. And then on the road sign, um, James has provided a nice sign out front that would be the same size as his underneath the digital display. So what we're looking for is them to see our logo, see those outside units, and say, oh, yeah, there's the heat pump store. Um, I don't have anything else to say except just, I don't know if you're aware of this, but the new Wentworth School has heat pumps, a new, a new Intermediate school. Mm, yeah, they're they're becoming very popular. Are you aware of that? I am. I'm aware of that. I, I did not win that bid. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, it's it's very important for us to get out in this area. Um, we it's our passion actually to do a really good job and aesthetically pleasing job. I think that's very important. Um, I want to. It's very. It's advantageous for us to make these things look beautiful. 
um, a for the for the town and B so the customer is okay. So so this would be primarily this would be for both commercial as well as residential customers. Correct. Okay. That larger dual fan unit is also a commercial unit. It's the same size and the same look. It has a different um, model number, but it's the same size. Okay. I have nothing else. Thanks. Susan? Thank you. Um, okay. I'm looking at the three photos. Mm -hmm. Photo one, those are just boxes out there. Oh, to the left, yes. They're not <laughs> No. bad photo. Okay. Number two I get. Number three is number two with what? I mean, there's white spaces with, I don't understand what number three is. I, <laughs> I am a student of the business, and that was my first attempt at getting, uh, to send over to Jay um, of what my idea was, and I'm not a very good... Um, what are those tall white... That, those would be the slim duck or the conduit and you're for the have piping. That out there. The piping has to introduce the refrigeration lines into the building. And that will be part of your display. What I Correct. see on page on, on number two, front of building, are the actual. Yep. And then you're going to have something going up from each one of those. Not quite that not far quite up. Not quite that it's far up. No, yeah, not that far right. up at all. What I did in picture one and two was um, to get the message clearer is that I went out and set the units outside on their stands and then okay. took a couple photos. Um, photo three was my first attempt. And then uh, <laughs> Jay recommended that I maybe um, paint a better picture, and I thought, why not just put them on the why stands and get them over to you? Why not just put them out there? Yeah. <laughs> I don't have any problems with this. I mean, I think it's, it's a wonderful product. I really do think, I'm sorry, but I'm technologically impaired. Okay. If I drive by this, I'm going to say, oh, look at those funny-looking mm. items out there, you know? That's my job so at I marketing. Th I think that marketing is key in this. Yep. And if you tell people that they need to go by so they can see <clears> them, I'm not so sure that it's going to sell you anything mm. by just putting them out there. But as long as it doesn't accumulate other stuff, no. you know what I'm saying? Yes, I absolutely okay. do. I have no problem. Thank you. Thanks. Mike? Hmm. I think if somebody was watching this <coughs> from the south, they'd probably be laughing at you know, <laughs> the fact that we're uh, all yeah. amazed at heat pump technology. But it's been around quite a few years. and and now that the new technology allows it to work well in the, in the northern climates. Um, I, I'm, I'm not really excited about how this is going to end up looking. Mm -hmm. um, I kind of look at it like if, if the applicant was before us today building the building, presenting the building to us, and they presented this, we'd probably have a lot to say mm -hmm. about what they can do to, to kind of shield that. Because from the passerby and from our perspective, if you will, it, it really is just going to look like mechanicals that belong to the building. For, yes, for, for, I agree. For yeah. And I would imagine that <coughs> those uh, line sets that go up the side of the building, that's not your ideal install. That would be an existing building type install, but a new install, you wouldn't even see those line sets. And that's, where we, that's what we would be talking about if we were building a new building. Absolutely. Um, is there, um, on, an, on a typical install, though, is, it's Dave, right? Yeah, uh, Matt. Matt, okay. Dave's world, sorry. No so, problem. Um, in a typical install, though, are they, is it recommended that they uh, be placed under windows? Um, no, it, it is not. Um, again, we are trying to showcase the all the different sizes. I picked the small one. Well, actually, let me take that back. Yes, we have done that. Um, a little okay. bit so more north of here, but... By, co by code, are they allowed to be placed under yes. windows? They Depends are. on which town, but typically, yes. Um, we have no issue at all with that. Um, the, well, the my, my follow-up would be that... Um, I don't know if we have a definitive answer. If Scarborough's code allows them to be placed under windows. I know um, Matt has had some discussion with Jim Butler, I believe, our commercial code inspector, Correct. and they have seen these pictures and details and haven't expressed anything to me right. today. Um, in terms of I'm just wondering if they looked at it from uh, um, from an angle as if it was uh, a pre being presented to them for uh, for a um, for a pr for a permit. Mike, if I could, yeah. The uh, when you have a crank out window, yeah, that's when it's an issue. Because the because the window gets in the way the of Anderson it? windows from the 90s when you cranked them out and if it, you couldn't open that window that's when right. it's a problem. That's 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 the only thing. All right. See, the only I, 
I don't, I don't know. I, I would just think that intuitively um, they wouldn't be placed on the windows for other reasons. Just because, you know, you open a window, you don't want that fan noise. And it's absolutely true. Um, what's don't happening... they expel heat also? What's that? They expel heat, too. When That's the most important part about them, is uh, aesthetics sometimes are outweighed by functionality yeah. and efficiency and, and putting some ROI back in the, in the homeowner's pocket. We have probably 10 or 12 times, I think, if I remember correctly, if I went back and counted, that we did end up doing it that way. This is not... That is far from what I would talk somebody into doing. Um, I want people, I want this to catch their eye. I want to have the opportunity to come in and discuss all the different ways that these work. The line sets are for um, homes where we cannot access and go through a sill and then up in an inside mm -hmm. wall. It's the best we can do as far as what this building is offering. Um, it's a great product and um, without uh, displaying it. No, we're not debating the product. Yep. Um, and uh, we're not debating the popularity of it. Um, I get, I, you know, and I, I'm not going to get in the, I, I'm not going to vote against it. I just, I, 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 I want to have this kind of conversation because um, at the end of the day, there's going to be, there's going to, you're going to need other mechanisms. And you say that's what you guys do, maybe second best is your marketing, right? Your Correct. Your first is installing. I would say the first best is our marketing. Um, oh, okay. Nothing happens without that. Um, because, the passerby is just going to see this as part of the building. So they, they're going to, you know, I guess your signage, is that coming before us? That will, it, it won't, but if that's tastefully done, of course, then I'll associate Dave's role with heat pumps, and then I'll come in here and, and take a look at the units. But um, from driving by, it's just going to look like a part of the building. And you can't avoid that. I think that one would... To, um, to appropriately disagree, Mike, I, I think that one would give you the sense that it's a mechanical device, but when you have six of them, I'm, a, I'm hoping that it's going to... I think, I think a lot of people are just going to say, wow, I wonder why they need so that many... That place needs a lot of heat. <laughs> <laughs> Understood. Thank you. Um, are you going to have to remove any existing vegetation? No. There's nothing going to be done other than that. Um, the what we'd like to do is maybe add some flowers in between. Um, James and I will talk about that if it's ex accepted. But I think there are ways of making it look, look a little bit better. But as of right now, no. Well, um, I guess to, uh, to summarize, I would say that if this, um, I, I, I like it better when I don't see a heat pump in front of a window or underneath the window. If there's any way they can be shifted to allow the eye to kind of like just look at the window and then see a heat pump to the left or right of it. I understand that you might not be able to do that in all cases, but if you can do that in some cases um, and still be able to display your product, uh, I think that would be, in my view, um, a little bit better looking than, than what we have here. Um, are those stands part of the install also? Correct. Yep. There. Um, that's the. One way of doing it, the other way is a foundation mount, which we don't have the opportunity here. Right. That could be a little bit cleaner look, but I wasn't unfortunately able to do that. Now, um, I'm sure the, uh, are, you, are you the owner of the building? Um, so two years from now, you're going to be so successful, you're going to want to build your own building right on Route 1, 15,000 square feet probably. Not, um, and how is, okay. the, is the owner going to be able to bring his building back to its original um, grandeur? I mean, okay, all right, good. All right, very good then. Well, welcome uh, to Scarborough, and uh, I, I wish you all the luck. If you could just take those few those few um, suggestions, I'd appreciate it, you know, mm -hmm. but um, I wish you all, I, I know you're going to be successful because I see them going up all the time as it is, so um, I just think that if we can just uh, let the eye go to the window and not the unit, I think it might be a little bit better off in the overall. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Susan? Just a quickie. This is summer season only, right? No. no. Heating cool. Heating and cooling all year long. They're capable Probably. of heating um, well below minus 13 where they're rated. No, I mean they're going to be out there. <laughs> all year long. All year long. Functioning all year long. Uh, functioning? Yeah. Functioning. This is a full interactive display. Okay. 
I'm not too sure exactly who, uh, the, I mean, I'm a marketing person. I really am. And my husband is an HVAC engineer, so I know a little bit about this stuff. And I'm not too sure who it is you think is going to benefit from this. I will. You will. Well, that's okay. good. Um, I just, okay, never mind. It's just, it's just a personal, it's just a personal thing. I, I, I think that it's not going to be that distractive, and so I try to best of Thanks. Them. Yeah, and I, I don't think we need to get into a. I don't even. Discussion about marketing specifically, no. but right. I do. I, I appreciate your, your thought. Um, so I, I guess it's. I was going to ask how Meineke feels about this, but it sounds like those interests are pretty well aligned. <laughs> uh, <laughs> All right. Um, I mean, I share some of the ambivalence, absolutely, um, with the, Mr. Wood and Ms. Aguas in terms of the the look. And obviously, I mean, I think, as I said before, the, the fact that I wanted to bring this to the board is probably an indication the fact that I wasn't quite sure how I felt about it myself. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, I don't, I don't think I feel strongly enough about it to oppose it. And, um, you know, it... I almost, I almost want to say, you know, you almost want to put a balloon on each one of those so that it <laughs> looks like it's, and that's something that I would absolutely never. There's, there's way more I could do to I'm attract them. I'm just generally very, I'm very dead set against having. How about ribbons and, that come out of the? Oh no no no. Right. right. <laughs> so that's just, I'm just saying that as an indication of, you know, sort of. We have um, done this in, like I said, in, a, in two other stores um, to reflect on the window. One of the things that I do like about the window is when you have the clients. Th keep in mind, this is, a dis this is an interactive display. This is not, we're not saying, telling the client this is what it's going to look like. But when they're in our store and it's going through a defrost cycle, which we can make it go into, we want them to be able to look out and see it without being outside when it's minus 15 degrees out and they're shopping. It's actually worked very well for us, to, for the client to be inside looking out at our product rather than being outside when it's cold. I completely respect the way you, where you guys are coming from, but that in this case, it's not. We're not going after the aesthetic looks of this is what it's going to look like at your home, but this is a functioning display that we need you to understand the mechanics of the device before the, it is purchased. All right. Thank you, and I would also echo what, what Mike said about signage. I think that that will be an important complement to that in terms of the. Obviously, you want it for branding purposes, and I think the more that that can be sort of tied in, the better. So. We, we could do a little bit more. Um, that would be a discussion with James after, but I was under understanding to keep it really simple out on the so outside of yeah, that building. Yeah, I don't building. think any of us are suggesting anything garish or crazy, mm -hmm. but just, you know, again, something that sort of makes it somewhat clear. Display or showroom or something like that in that regards. I think you you'd need to come up to the podium if you want to say any more. Thanks. I'm Jamie Kelly. I own Kelly Plaza. Um, I think from the roadside, we have a berm that's up there, so you can't really see that far in anyway. So it, it's going to be essential for him to have the signage. Um, okay. Yeah. But yeah. I think it'll all tie in as far as you know how it all, how it's all going to look and everything. All right. Well, it's certainly in your interest to, as it's been stated, to make it as clean and attractive as possible. So I don't think we need to labor it anymore. I have a very short and sweet motion. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I saw. I, I have one question. I, I, I didn't think I'd have this opportunity, <clears throat> but I was watching one of your commercials not too long ago, and I'm curious. Um, a heat pump store. You wouldn't think it'd be called Dave's World. I know, right? So you should have saw me in front of 2,000 people in Las Vegas so when I was getting the award. Where does Dave's World come from? Dave's World was um, created in 1981 from Dave, and the whole idea was in Dover Foxcroft. There's not a lot of opportunity for retail and it gets very slow in certain times. So he was selling appliances and Radio Shack and US Cellular uh, when it first came. So it was basically his world. Um, if I could do, if I could pay a million dollars to change the name, I would. Um, I don't have that opportunity to be in the owner now because of the um, 40,000 customers that we have. So it was a scary thing to try to change, but it actually worked, um, to believe it or not, um, when we were Every, so we've got that award three years in a row, and it's really funny because you have ABC heating and cooling. You have, but for some reason it sticks out that it's a, it's it, because it's so different. The client actually remembers it, and it's right. in, so it, it actually okay. backfired in a good way for me. So. Excellent. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks. Thank With you that, very much. 
I will move to approve the application of Matthew Scott of Dave's World for the application of accessory outside display at 237 Gorham Road. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor. Thank you. That's you Thank know. you, everyone. Awesome. See, marketing does work. Now, wait a minute. <laughs> All right. Oh, what did he have? <coughs> Item number eight. 137 U.S. Route 1 Scarborough Realty LLC Prime Mercedes-Benz requests a preliminary site plan amendment review as part of the contract zone modification for 137 U.S. Route 1 oh, Assessor's Map U47 Lot 94. Jay? Thank you, Mr. Chair. <coughs> um, as you just noted, the applicant is before you to amend a contract zone which was originally approved in 2002. As the as board members may recall, it was just about a year ago, maybe even a little less than that, that the applicant was before you to um, previously amend the contract zone. That amendment included really two distinct items. One was to uh, bring fold in the former gas station and expand their parking lot to the I'll call it south of the property. Then the other bit was to expand the building, which was going to include a storage bay and a car wash. I'm sure you have all noted the gas station is gone, the parking lot has been expanded, the building expansion component has not been forward to date. The applicant is actually before the board and actually I should say before the council as well because they want to do a two, um, I guess, storage bays or garage bays and I'm sure they'll explain their use better than I will, um, and a car wash which expands the building to over 26,000 square feet, which is larger than what the current contract zone allows. So they need to, they're working through the council for a contract zone modification process. As part of that process, they've been to the council for first reading. They're before this board for a preliminary site plan review. So the board's charge tonight is to ensure that the application is generally in order moving forward through a site plan process. Um, maybe all the T's and I's aren't quite dotted, but the, the general direction is there. And then to provide direction to the council if there's any direction that you, you see fit to, guys. Um, once and if the board does do the preliminary approval, we'll go back to council. Should council approve the contract zone amendment, it would then come back to this board for a final site plan approval where all modifications would be made and we'd be dealing with a full plan set. So that sort of sets the, sets the stage. In terms of all that, um, you should have received staff comments. We went through the application materials as submitted, provided staff overview comments in terms of the site plan review ordinance um, provisions. So I have a host of items on, on a, number of, a number of the review criteria, um, but I think that the sort of the <coughs> uh, main elements that I'll focus on have to do with particularly um, internal vehicular circulation in parking areas. Um, just noting that the proposed expansion of the building is going to encumber an area that is often used, utilized right now for, it's either parked vehicles or, um, parked vehicles or uh, display of vehicles. It's not entirely clear to staff what, what's being used there. And that area is going to be tightened up quite a bit with this building expansion. Um, so just being sure that this 25 foot drive aisle be remained open and how that impacts parking areas on the site. Um, the other issues that we flag are um, in terms of a couple of things. In terms of um, there is the approved plan from about a year ago. Um, not all the elements from that plan have been fully developed yet, in particular to the landscape plan. Um, so I think it would be helpful as this moves forward for the applicant to talk about sort of their expectation for bringing that to fruition and how this proposal would modify any of that. To that end, that actually ties to step my final point, which really has to do with, and we talked about this last time, one of the main elements, I think, um, in terms of the building expansion for the board to consider is the design standards typically seek to ensure that garage doors, uh, bay doors, uh, don't directly face public streets. Clearly, the board at the last application felt that, you know, what was proposed was adequate, and so there's an additional door. So 
Um, staff will again uh, mention that it might be worthy, a, a good time to take a, a second look at the landscape plan and think, are there opportunities to enhance tree, street trees, in particular to the uh, enhancements that the town's done with our uh, project canopy tree plantings that have been done on the, in the area? Is there a way to coordinate that and maybe that could be an opportunity um, to be fit into this application? So with that, Mr. Chair, I'll turn it back to you and am prepared to answer questions as they may come up. Thanks, Jay. And I'll hand it off to the applicant. Uh, thank you, Jay, Mr. Chair, members of the Planning Board. Uh, Jay, another great job doing the introduction. Um, as he mentioned, this project was back la was uh, in front of the board last year for a, I believe it was the second uh, contract zone amendment. Uh, basically to add the Sunoco parcel and to also get a relaxation on uh, setback for the parking. As you can see on uh, driving down Route 1, the parking lot has been uh, constructed. The building expansion has not been undertaken. Uh, basically to keep in, in uh, setting with the current branding, they would actually have to expand the building, which was going to take it beyond the current uh, max building threshold for the contract zone, which is about 25,200 square feet. As proposed, we're about 26,750. Uh, we are in front of the town council to increase that maximum bu building footprint to uh, 26,900. Uh, the building expansion is roughly 3,700 square feet. Um, you know, we have looked at the uh, staff comments. Uh, where we're losing about six parking spaces. I've shown a 25-foot drive aisle with a 16-foot uh, end island. I can decrease that end island to add a little bit more of a fire lane along that building edge um, and maintain the kind of the typical Chevron striping for a fire lane. Um, as far as the site, it's, you know, impervious surface now. It's currently paved. It's going to be uh, building, no real changes to stormwater. Uh, it's all going to sheet flow across the park and into the existing detention facility, um, which was expanded uh, last year to accommodate the existing impervious surface for the uh, parking. And as far as the site, I've got that's pretty much my presentation. I have uh, Dan Doucet from Prime Motor. Uh, hi. Uh, thank you for hearing me. Uh, yeah, so we, we've expanded the the original uh, approved building by uh, uh, one bay, uh, actually two bays if you look at the back side of it. But uh, uh, we, when we initially came before the board, we had a set of requirements from the manufacturer that changed, and it, and it changed slightly. Uh, all we needed was one additional bay to to get us through uh, 2020. So this is the predicament we're in now is that uh, we were all set to go and we spent the money in engineering, architecture. We were, we were the, the, the contractor was ready to go and then I got the new requirements from the manufacturer and after talking with Dave from Goran Turgeon, he suggested that look, once we put that car wash in, the expense of moving it is, for, is insane. So let's try to go before the town, see if we can squeeze this in. That's why we're here. And we've addressed all the uh, concerns that caught up, uh, that, that were brought up, and, and we, uh, we're, uh, we have a, a, a landscape architect working on it. We're going to bring more color uh, to the site. Uh, we're going to beautify it more. We have, we have some trees coming in. Yeah, uh, we can, like Dave can. And aesthetically, the, it looks much better aesthetically with the additional bay. Uh, I think we have a comparison here. Hi, my name is Dave Richards. I'm an architect with Gower Ar Turgeon Architects, and thank you for hearing our uh, our uh, request to. Uh, increase the size of the addition that we had approval for before. It's about a 1,700 square foot increase from what was approved prior to, which essentially allows a slice wider to add two bays, 
to the building, which will buy them deep into the future. Once the car wash is placed, it's impractical to go from parts as the way the building is used to, go, you know, to have additional service space. So this is kind of it. So once we realize that and the increases were being asked by Mercedes, you know, it was time to ask to see if, if this was, you know, a sensible way to go. Now, from an aesthetic standpoint, actually it appears to be more balanced and less stubby. But that's a matter of opinion. The initial approval is. It's on. It's on. Okay, the initial approval is up here in this top corner. Mm -hmm. So you have this kind of stubby looking. The new concept, right there. Aesthetically, it, it, it's much better looking. And then Dave can go over the uh, landscape design. So when we originally came before you, and when we came before you for the first, uh, for the, to build the building originally, um, we had issues with the need to have overhead doors located in the front of the building where it's preferred by the town to not have them. So to ameliorate the look of them, what we did was these are all aluminum uh, overhead doors. They look almost identical to the storefront except for the fact that they come down to grade and uh, they're actually extremely functional and very handsome. They make the spaces very nice, and they really do look more like storefront than they do look like your standard industrial overhead door, which most people prefer to do because they're less expensive. Um, this width is, I believe, uh, 10 foot by 14 foot. That has to do with the fact that sometimes sprinters will be in here, the Mercedes-Benz van, and they need that clearance, so that's why they're that height, whereas the lower doors were originally put in because at the time we were only bringing cars through there. Um, yeah, and then uh, when we came before you, we were talking about just the work in this area, but we are aware that this work hasn't been completed, and one of the reasons it hasn't been completed because uh, Mercedes-Benz has contracted our office to create landscaping uh, opportunities throughout the site because we're aware that you know there's, there could be more color and we think that it's to the advantage for the town and also for the dealership to enhance its look. So before we come, you know, before we get back again for the next uh, meeting, we'll have that all you know as construction documents and all finalized, but it's in process right now. And this is just a, a representation, you know, a quick kind of graphic representation of how it might look. When we first come in, this is all grasses now that would be, you know, color added as such, particularly at the entry and then down at the end and then a, uh, a, a big splash of color around the proposed sign. And that's about it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll open it up for any public comment. If there is anyone out there, we do have someone. Just introduce yourself and sure. try to keep it to five minutes or less. And name, five minutes. Name and address, please. I hope I'm not here that long. My name is Robert Cook. I live at 30, uh, 26 First Street, Scarborough, Maine. I look out my front door and I look at the ass end of Mercedes Benz. Okay, so this is where I'm coming from. I do not like Ira Rosenberg, but it doesn't make any difference here. I don't have a problem with what they're doing. I really don't. I have a problem with you people, the people before you, okay? If, what, if you're going to give this guy this plan, I don't have a problem with it. But when I call up and ask a question, I don't want the answer. I wasn't here then. Jay made a very nice comment, making a paper trail. It should have been years ago, been done years ago. I was nose to nose with the manager at the time. It took five stamps, that's all it took, but he couldn't bother to send them. I was in Florida. I have a set of plans that nobody else has because they changed them when I wasn't here. I said, you couldn't send me a letter? We put it in uh, the ledger. I said, don't you try to tell me you're assuming that everybody read it. I said, I don't read that paper. I don't read any newspaper. 
So my fault is not with them, it's with you people. If you do this, write it down. So five years from now, when I've been told four or five different things, and I get, I wasn't here then. There were no tractor trailers to come in and out of that back entrance. They come in and out all the time. They park on my street, empty cars. I think I've handled that. They park inside their lot, run the diesel trucks. These guys show up 8, 9, 10 o'clock at night, sit there all night with their diesels running. I've convinced one driver to back down when nobody can hear him. And uh, when I call and complain, which I was told this was going to happen, I wasn't here then. It, it doesn't fly. I've been quite aggravated at Ira personally and the board. I'm glad to hear Jay say, let's make a paper trail. You're going to make a paper trail on another one, let's make it on this one. Because I, I asked Ira, I says, Ira, can I at least have a stop sign? He puts up a stop sign, 12, 12 inches. The stop sign's gone. There's a big sign, no left turn coming out of the driveway. Everybody drives through it. They're mechanics, they're salesmen, they uh, come out of that driveway and they don't slow down. I don't have young kids now. If I did, there'd be a real big issue. There's no small kids on that street, but they don't deserve to be on those streets, the truck, truck, the trailers, but they come in every day, in and out. So, personally, they can put what they want and not. Uh, like I told him before, the uh, flowers look nice. I was a little pain in the butt last time you mentioned. But please, write it down, okay? Because you may not be here when someone else complains it. Because I was told, note there, no trucks, this, 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 and this. And all of a sudden, and in my understanding, this is the second time they've been, here, been before the board before. To, to get the first ones they were talking about, the changes they want to do. I want to know why I wasn't notified. The first time. I got a notice for this one. I abut him. Like I say, when I look out my, my house, it's a little crooked. My back door is my main house. And I look at the ass, excuse my language, ladies, the ass end of uh, Mercedes Benz. And to alienate me to make it happy, they raised the parking lot. So I said, well, maybe if I can get an eight foot fence. That's when Ira and Ira went nose to nose. He says, you went down to talk to the good old boys at town hall. I says, my issue isn't with you, it's with them. The town told me, okay, this wasn't going to happen, this wasn't going to happen. Okay? So let's write it down. And I'd like to see you make them put up an eight-foot fence. I'm myself and there's two of us, three of us. This is what we see all day. And for God's sakes, will you tell the people to, excuse me, Dan, will you tell the people not to get those beeples to go off all day long, their keys, bing, 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 bing. That's a great sound. And Susan, I apologize for interrupting, but that's just me sometimes. So, so please, write it down. So it's, uh, yeah, I've been upset my neighbor's worse than I am, but you don't want him down here. Okay? So I see nothing wrong with this. Okay? Because now I can't see it. You know why I can't see it? How big is your roof? Do you know? Just yeah. one side. It's not supposed to do it. You guys hey, excuse me, we can't... Oh, okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. My, my point is, when I look out, my, come out onto my deck, I've got this beautiful big white wall. And the, the plans I have have the building in front of me. It's just, it's been a mess from neighbors. And if Ira says one more time, my neighbors love me, I'm going to do something about, oh, my neighbors, my neighbors love me. Maybe the neighbors in Saco do, but the one in Scarborough don't particularly care for it. Okay, they've been sort of good neighbors. I really can't complain. The people that work over there, they're great. But let's just write it. I guess my point without repeating, let's write it down. Okay, right. I got to be near five minutes now. You're right there. Thank you. You're Susan, <laughs> we're to Falls. Oh, oh, sorry, we have someone oh, else. Really I hard. apologize. No, that's okay. Um, Barbara Foley, Eight First Street. Um, I was here when they originally built the building. And I know that in that contract zone, we locked them down tight for the neighborhood. And walking my dog one night, I get to the corner of Hudson and First Street and out of the dealership, left hand turn, car goes up, goes into a residence driveway, turns around and goes back down and back into the dealership with no license plate on it, 
and they're not supposed to be test driving on Route 1, on First Street, Maple Ave, Elmwood, Sunset, for second, third, that's all in their contract zone and they constantly do that. I've seen their um, little car carrier, uh, it's pulled by a pickup truck. Instead of going in off of Route 1, he comes down and he comes in through First Street. I've seen their parts van fly up First Street. I'm down at the end of First Street to its Maple Ave and I've been woken up one time anywhere from 2 to 4 o'clock by their dumpsters being emptied. They need to be held accountable to their contract zone that where they can and can't do things. Also, I'll tell you, their landscape business, I'd never call them because they park on Route 1 on the sidewalk and block the sidewalk. And as far as I know in the parking thing, in the parking ordinance, only a police officer can tell you to park there on a sidewalk. And they block the sidewalk on Route 1. So right there, it's bad business for Prime. I don't recommend anybody buying a car from them, and I wouldn't recommend their landscape company. So when this comes to the town hall, town council, I hope that we can make them accountable for everything that we put into that contract zone in the beginning. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you. Susan? Thank you. I'm going to start by using my basic approach to these things. I thoroughly dislike contract zones. I hate contract zones. I think it's called spot zoning. I don't know how you can call it anything else. But we have an ordinance in our town that allows us to have contract zones. And here's one that's a classic example. This is not supposed to be here, but we gave them a contract zone. And things just keep on happening. I'm not too sure what to do with this at several different levels. The first level I really don't know what to do with is the point that we're going to now have three bays facing onto Route 1. I have no problem with it being larger. That's not a big deal to me. But I do think we have an issue with the fact that we now have another bay opening onto Route 1, and how do you camouflage that? How do you put that in keeping with the design standards which say you're not supposed to be doing this? So that is a real big issue to me. And I hope that these comments will go to the council when they take a look at the next stage because I think that the design standards are only as worthy as they are implemented. I didn't want this, the last change to be implemented because it was going against the design standards. And here we are, again, expanding the way it does not meet our design standards. And I'm, I'm really very troubled about that. I hope that the um, comments by the residents who are here is, are also given to the council. I know that should this pass the council, it's going to come back to us as a planning board to talk about the specifics. I'm known as a landscape lady for a good reason. Jay will tell you how many times I've called him to find out where is Prime Motors Landscaping? Where is it? Didn't they have a landscaping plan? I don't see any landscaping plan. And now I'm told that we have a contract out for some landscaping on something that was supposedly okayed by us during your last coming. So I'm really interested in how that landscaping plan is not only going to make up for what you haven't done, but maybe make it better than what it was that you should have done but haven't done. I hope that you also take into account our street trees thing, but I mean, this isn't the time to go into all of that. We'll go into all of that the next time you come back because I have no doubt that you will be back. I don't really have an issue with the increased size. I don't know what to do about the, 
design standards. I'm totally at a loss. I have no idea what to do. I think we've lost this battle. It's too late. It's like we've got two. We're going to add a third. What are we going to do, make them go back and change one and two? I don't know. I think we've lost it. But this is the entry to Scarborough. <coughs> the entry to Scarborough, okay? And I love the little, um, oh, it's up there. Yes. Notice how there's all that space between all those vehicles on that drawing. There's no space between all those vehicles. It is vehicle to vehicle to vehicle to vehicle, absolutely stuffed with cars. Why don't I have some landscaping to buffer some of that? I especially love those big white things that sit there with their rear ends facing Route 1. You know, there just isn't a lot of concern that I can see for wanting to make Scarborough be excited about this being here. But they are here. And I understand that my job is to, at this point, say, is there an ordinance problem? No. I don't think the increased size is a big issue. And I think that you can take care of the parking. I don't think that your circulation is an issue. And I expect that we'll be seeing it again. And when we see it again, then we'll talk about some of these things that are a little more refined. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Roger? Thank you. Um, I think we have um, maybe have a couple of issues here. Uh, one is the, um, the abutters, and I Excuse me. <laughs> um, and it seems to me that that could be resolved by just going back over the, uh, the original conditions for the contract zone. Um, I have to believe that all that information is written down somewhere, all the, all the uh, constraints and the guidelines and everything else that the operation has to uh, abide by. So, um, and I appreciate the comments that the abutters have made, and it seems to me that they most of the, those things can be resolved, I, I would think. Um, regarding this proposal, um, I have to somewhat disagree with my colleague to my left here because um, I think this is a fantastic looking facility and it's a tremendous improvement over what was there before and I think it's a, it's a very attractive entrance into the town. Um, I, I am somewhat disappointed that landscaping around the new parking area it hasn't been resolved yet, but I'm assuming what you're saying is going to happen. Um, I want to believe that. Um, regarding the, over, the, o the overhead doors, I, I go by this, I'm sure we all go by the place all the time. Frankly, I don't think anybody is going to notice the overhead doors. This facility is a, is a pretty good sized facility and with um, with the landscaping, with the vehicles. When people go by this facility, they're looking at the cars that are on display. They're not looking at doors. And I just, I just don't think that's going to be a big enough issue. I understand the town's preferences to have the doors on the sides or in the back of the building. But in this case, I, I'm not sure it's, it's a workable design. So um, I guess I... The, the only question I have is on this fire lane. The qu what, can you show me where this fire lane is? Because this seems to be an issue. I think I know where it is. Basically, uh, what we were proposing was maintaining a 25-foot drive aisle off of the building and then so as not to have to restripe all the spaces, we we're just going to add the extra width back into a uh, end island. Okay. This end island can be narrowed up, basically give a, a fire lane right here. Okay. Basically, it'll, it'll, it'll have the appearance of extra width, but it'll be striped for 25 feet. Okay, uh, that's where I thought it was, but I wasn't sure. Okay. Roger, could I just make a sure. clarifying point on staff's comments? We're perfectly happy with the 25-foot width as it is. We would not advocate for narrowing down that parking lot island in any way. We just want to be sure. Right now what happens is, you know, this proposed addition isn't there, and there's quite a bit of parking that occurs along okay. this area. Yeah. And so that was all our comment was, was if it's going to be 25 feet, that's perfectly adequate, no problems. It's just 
where are those cars going to go that are currently parked in that? Again, they're adding a whole building section here, so there's a lot of pavement being lost. They, they've talked about adding six additional parking spaces, <laughs> and that might well do it. But I just want to be clear on staff's point. We are not advocating for narrowing down that planting island. Okay. If anything, I, we, I was we appreciate okay. the size of that and believe that you know any enhancements are of that ilk are are important. Now on the um, on the trees, I'm assuming your landscape is going to coordinate with with the town because the town has this tree canopy thing. Canopy grant yep. thing. All right, so I, that's going to be all coordinated, I think, isn't it? Wouldn't well, it be? when they come back, we'll need to see a full landscaping plan, but we could certainly coordinate <laughs> with the type of trees that have been planted in the area. Okay. To Okay. To work forward, but again, they have a number of sh trees along their frontage as it is. So I think, you know, that's sort of a discussion for the landscape architect to take a look at how, what makes the most sense in that area. And the, um, if I recall, Jay, in your in your staff re um, comments, you mentioned something about the material building materials and the car wash. And didn't, wasn't that discussed at the last that, time, that too? That was. So, exactly. So there was a, and actually, I might be able to pull it up here. So there was one of the conditions of approval last time, um, and it's being depicted here again. Um, corner there, there's this corner treatment and this, this uh, sort of mason stonework at the base of the rest of the building, and then you get to the car wash and it disappears. And that was actually a condition that the board put on the prior approval, that that sort of um, treatment be carried around the car wash. So I uh, just echoed the board's prior condition of approval and thought it, if the board thought it made sense at that time, probably would echo it at this time. Okay. I have, I have nothing further. Thank you. Mike? Thanks. Um, okay, speaking to the, uh, the approval, it's, it's pretty close to what we saw before, so I don't have a whole lot to add to it. I. I think that the treatment of the overhead doors is the way to go. Um, what do you call it? Like a you know dividing the light, if you will. Yeah, it it, it looks fine to me. Um, I do agree that the tr the treatment of the building should be carried out throughout, including the corner of the um, of the car wash. Um, I'm I'm glad to hear that the landscaping is going to take a serious look and you're going to be back before us. Did you have a question on? Come on up. Um, what, what you're looking at in the car wash and, and what we did to incorporate the car wash into the overall look of the building was we brought the synthetic stucco around the top. Down at the bottom, that's a proprietary system. It's a white sleeve that is filled with concrete, the exterior, it's a, it's a vinyl, it's, it's quite sheer, they slide into each other and then the inside is another special type of vinyl that's meant to deal with, you know, the hurricane effect that car washes have. Car washes are notorious for destroying themselves. We can add the base around it. It's, it'll look a little odd because we have no place to flash to. Do you follow what I'm saying? I have a sheer piece of vinyl plank coming down and then I'm going to put uh, uh, the masonry out in front of it, put flashing over top of it, and then that flashing has to be adhered to that vinyl, and then uh, sealant has to be in there so that water doesn't get in there and tear the whole thing apart. So it is doable. So it it's sounds to me you have a solution to it. It's not a great, it's not a great so the, construction. The, and what it, you're it, saying is that the car wash, the car wash uh, appendage is... Um, is different in, in, um, in its construction composition. Technique, yeah, f because of its purpose. That's not. That's not really. I don't see that how that's depicted here. It, it will appear as a as a white mass, not unlike the the synthetic stucco does. The difference will be is that it'll have a. It won't be glossy, but it won't be as matte as you know a sand finishes well, on I guess a synthetic I, stucco. I guess is there a way that you can better present? to me next time what I it's going to look could like? Bring a, I could bring you the product and you know, one of the pieces of the sleeves and then you could see it and then we could Because I don't know if my colleagues feel the same way, but it, it, it looks, from, from these photos, it looks like it's, it's carrying the same kind of materials all the way through that. Yeah, it, it's not in fact, but I believe from 20 feet away it, it would appear as such. There is a different sheen to the product, okay. you know, truth in advertising. Um, but. 
the um, in, in your in your picture, you see the uh, the blue the blue SUV in front of the car wash door. Yeah. Now, when when you look at the uh, overhead uh, bird's eye view, it looks like an awfully tight. I mean, if that I, I imagine that's that's representative of a real uh, real life scenario. It is. Um, and it just appears that it's an awfully uh, leaves very little room to drive uh, from the uh, front of the building to the to the side of the building. Do you have Do you have a, a measurement of that? Yeah, that's uh, that's over four feet. Four feet. Four feet from the edge of the the door where the ballads are. I'm talking about the end of the vehicle to the landscape area, the pavement we're that's on. remaining. Uh, that I. Yeah. Let me one second. This right here? Yes. Yeah. 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 That's, that's 25 right there. So there's, off of that apron, there's more than 25 feet. Before, before you're uh, at the rear of that vehicle? Put up, why don't you put this up? Do you have this? Yeah, put that one up. That's good, right there on the top. Oh, right there. The yep, no. no. I have precisely the one you're looking at. All right, the one on the bottom there, the photo on the bottom? Yeah. You have the vehicle in front of the car wash bay? Yes. And it appears that there's very little opportunity to drive behind it. The approach to the car wash will be from behind. Okay, so I ask so again, I ask again, is that a real-life scenario, what you're depicting? No. The it's not. It's the wrong way. Yeah. Okay. So why are you doing I missed that, sorry. That's okay. You said yes. Yes. Okay. I missed that. I missed <laughs> All right, very good. So we're not going to have that. So that, that's good. Um, and the trees, we talked about the trees, because there, there is a great opportunity here to beautify this front. And like yep. uh, Susan says, um, I don't know if Su Susan, uh, were you on the board with us when we first? Yeah, so yeah. Susan and I were on the board when it was first approved in 2002, yep. the contract zone. Um, I pers you know, I remember what was there before, as it appears others do too, and this certainly is a big improvement. Um, everything, everything that's allowed and not allowed on contract zones are are good in one view, in one way, in that everything can be written down and should be written down, and I think, yeah, I like to say, is written down. So we do have paper trail. We know exactly what the hours of operation are. We know about. We talked about noise. We talked about vehicle circulation. We, took about, we talked about uh, minimizing uh, the impact uh, to the neighborhoods behind. And, and with the contract zone, the, na the, na uh, the citizens really can get involved, a lot more involved than, than uh, the case is on a conventional type of application. So it appears that we do need to look at that contract zone, the language, and to make sure that the applicant is adhering to all that it says. Um, and that's not to say that maybe we did miss a couple things back in 2002, and we can add a couple of things with, of course, with the cooperation of the applicant. But um, some of the things that I heard tonight, I, you know, my memory is not great, but and it was a long time; it was 13 years ago. But um, I'm quite certain that uh, that contract zone spoke about not using that neighborhood to test drive vehicles and to for ingress and egress, et cetera, except for. Uh, very specific uses and purposes. Um, <clears throat> so we need to revisit that. Now, we don't necessarily need to revisit that, but I hear the town council is going to be hearing this, and, and I know that they'll get these minutes, et cetera, and I presume you folks will be there too. So um, I know the town council will be very interested in looking at that, that contract zone to make sure that uh, everything is being adhered to. And uh, obviously they have, this, is, this is an opportunity for them to amend the contract zone. So... Um, so that's that. But as far as what you have before, I have really no inherent issues with what you have before us as far as your uh, request to expand. I'd like to get a better feel and understand as to what that car wash appendage actually, how it marries into the existing mm -hmm. building, uh, or I should say to the larger expansion, because that is marrying the existing building, is it not? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and the landscaping. We, it's a great opportunity to bring that landscaping up to what we all had hoped and envisioned uh, so many years ago. So I think that's enough. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, likewise, uh, I don't have any, any issue with sort of the, the core, the core uh, request here. I don't think 
be the additional size will really have any material impact. Um, you know, there's certainly some architectural details that we'll want to drill down on with the next step, assuming you come back to us. I um, think it would be good to, to get a better feel, literally, for that material on, on the car wash and yep. just kind of explore what can and can't be done to try and address the architectural issue there and try to make that as consistent as possible. Um, I absolutely appreciate what Ms. Oglis has said about the, the overhead doors, and I, I guess I'm not as troubled by it, partly because of the, the specific treatment here and, and, and what, what Roger said about sort of the overall massing of the building and, and where the eye is drawn. Um, but that said, I mean, I think that given that that um, that sort of goes against what we typically seek in the design standard that puts the burden on the applicant to really make sure that um, that, it, that it addresses it as attractively as possible um, and that will, may require some additional effort. Uh, but I think generally it's, it's um, not too big a deal in my opinion. Um, I'll also, like others, look forward to seeing more on the landscaping and seeing the landscaping itself actually done. Um, and I, I do hope the applicant is amenable to, to working with the town on the street trees. I understand with any, any sort of use like this, any, any retail use, let alone a, a, such a display intensive use like this with, with cars that are on display and that is the product, that there's always going to be a little bit of a balance between um, buffering, if you will, and beautifying this, mm -hmm. the streetscape and making sure that potential customers can actually see the business. Um, and I don't think any of us are suggesting that create a <coughs> wall of vegetation that would block that off. But I, you know, to echo what Susan has said, and I know it's been said before, this is a major gateway into the town. Um, I think overall it is a, is an attractive property, um, and just want to make sure we we always try to be opportunistic on these things as a board and as a town. So we have to take this opportunity to try and try and kind of raise the bar in that respect. Um, to um, sort of piggyback on what um, Mr. Wood was just saying about the sort of enforcement issues, if you will, on the existing contract zone. Um, I can assure you it is all in writing, um, and, it's, and, and it may be that there does need to be an effort to, to go back and, and really make sure that, um, that the letter of that, letter and spirit of that are being honored. Um, and again, you know, the, the onus, the burden is, is on the applicant particularly as it's coming back to ask for additional amendment here. It's perfectly understandable that the butters who already may have had some issues would expect that to be, be looked at. Um, so I absolutely trust that the council will, will have an interest in that. Um, with that, I don't think we need to belabor it any further. We've obviously got some concerns and questions, but I think on the underlying question, there's a consensus that um, we're okay with sending this off to the council. So I'd like to put a motion forward. Uh, I move to approve the preliminary site plan application of 137 U.S. Route 1 Realty, LLC, for the building addition and associated site improvements at the Mercedes-Benz site at 137 U.S. Route 1 as proposed in materials submitted on their behalf by Sebago Technics. This preliminary approval shall be considered a favorable opinion to the council in consideration of the contract zone amendment. Upon council adoption of the contra contract zone modifications, the applicant shall revise the site plans in accordance with staff comments and board discussion for final review and approval. Second. Have a second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Oh, we just you just, have just one thing regarding the contract zone because um, I was on the Sitco board, I think, when all this was going on, going on, and um, I think I'm not sure if you, if you were there. No, no, not you, the gentleman. <laughs> but you know, when you when when this was done, like you said, 11 years ago or something like this, 11 or 12 years ago, 14. And uh, th there's changes in in the operations of a business. So I think so it's, it's been pulled. Okay. Okay. We, we okay. can't have a we can't have an open <laughs> conversation. <laughs> the point I, I guess the point I'm trying to we're, yeah, we've the point I'm trying to make table. is that I think it's incumbent upon the business when they're involved in the contract zone to make sure if there's any change in people responsible for the business that they understand what the conditions are because it seems obvious to me that there's been some slippage here. 
I agree. Some of these that things. burden is definitely on yeah. the on yeah. the owner. So and I, I agree with Mike that there, you know, that is one area yeah. where, in theory, there's there are advantages to the contract now. So, thank you. Anything else? We have a second in motion. All in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you, Mr. Chair. If I could, just for the benefit of um, folks from the public. Um, I don't believe that when this goes back to council that there will be a letter, a mailing. I would suggest that you contact the town clerk to find out when it will be on the council agenda. Uh, uh, I, I, to ask. Yeah. I was under the understanding, please correct me if I'm wrong, that a potter has to be notified. I'm, I'm not sure about at the council level. I can only speak for the planning board. I, I staff the planning board, so that's where I'm suggesting contacting the town clerk. She would she would have the answer to that. Yeah. Tody clerk. Tody, Tody Justice would be able to answer this. Yeah. Yep. And you, you should have received a notif you received notification for this meeting. Right. Why didn't I receive the notice the first time? We will. We'll. I know that staff will address that for you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Oh, yep, there's a wire right over there. Just plug in and I'll take, yep, and I'll take mine right out. Should, should in theory, fire right up for you. All right, while we're getting set up here, I'll introduce the next item. Item number nine, ENF Limited Liability Company, Land Rover Jaguar of Scarborough, requests a preliminary site plan amendment review as part of contract zone modification for 371 U.S. Route 1, Assessor's Map U39, Lot 46A. Jay? Yep. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, as we just reviewed, this is a contract zone amendment for another one of our car dealerships um, that is further on down Route 1 for the Jaguar Land Rover site. Um, as I noted before, well, uh, actually by way of background, this contract zone was originally approved in 1996. Um, which enabled the development of an uh, auto dealership. Um, the applicant is now before the town, again, having been to the town council for first reading and before this board for the preliminary site plan review for an amendment to the original contract zone to enable the expansion of the building by roughly a thousand plus or minus square feet. Um, Again, you'll receive staff comments on the overall site plan elements as this is a site plan review by this board. Ostensibly, ostensibly, the site isn't changing all that much. Yes, there are some modifications, but I think principally the biggest element is a change in the architecture of the building. Um, and so we really pointed the board in that direction. Um, again, there are some modifications to some parking <coughs> areas and such, but um, the main element being uh, the, those architectural train changes. The one thing staff did know is that the applicants um, proposing right now to use a metal um, uh, metal materials on the front of the building. That is something that under design standards state is not is not allowed or is actually prohibited. And so, if that if the board and council are comfortable with with the design as presented, as being a more modern contemporary style, then that's probably something that should be entered into the contract zone as a, a an item that's noted um, because it is strictly prohibited. Where you know in other cases it's sort of discouraged, if you will. But this um, so I just sort of flag that. Um, again, I've, you have a host of other comments, but um, generally at this point, that's relatively good. And I turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Thanks, Jay. And I will hand it over to the applicant or their representative. Uh, thank you, Jay and Chairman, members of the board. Paul Strowski from Sebago Technics. Um, the changes to the building are relatively minor, about 1,100 square feet in total. Uh, currently, the building is about 13,400 square feet, proposing about 14,500 square feet. Uh, basically, that's on the going to be on the front facade. This is in front of town council as well to increase the maximum building footprint, because uh, as currently proposed, we would be violating the maximum uh, footprint. We've asked for a little bit extra. Basically, it's 14,730 is what we're asking for in contract. Uh, we will be saw cutting pavement around the building, adding concrete curb and sidewalk. There will be a net change of uh, the gain of two parking spaces. The existing rock track will be removed. 
Um, basically, it is a it's it's a it's a wash as far as impervious coverage goes, because that track was considered as impervious coverage uh, during our calculations, um, and you can see that on the uh, kind of the northerly side of the building, that's where we're proposing the five spaces where the track currently resides. Uh, no additional storm drain uh, proposed as it's currently sheep flowing into an existing uh, stormwater management pond that's on the uh, kind of easterly side of the of the parcel. Um, as far as the site's concerned, it's, you know, there's no utilities, no extra curb cuts, um, pretty pretty straightforward. I'm Ryan Senator with Ryan Senator Architecture, um, and uh, so we've been um, been been hired by uh, uh, Goodwins to uh, uh, renovate the building in accordance with um, Jaguar Land Rover uh, design guidelines. Um, and I'll kind of um, I brought a, a little PowerPoint presentation here. Um, and so essentially, the um, it's a little hard to see, but from this line here forward will all be new construction. So that's where the existing facility uh, in showroom exists now. We'll be removing that and reconstructing um, as, as um, like the Mercedes and all these um, the brands, they have standards that you have to meet in every certain uh, period of time you have to upgrade. So that's kind of why we're here tonight. Um, the, uh, the rest of the building will be um, uh, renovated, but the structure will remain. So we're basically talking about rebuilding this section and then this area will be um, improved and renovated. Um, I've brought the proposed exterior elevations here. Um, th this elevation is facing Route 1, um, and then this, this is the, um, the side toward the service bay, the rear of the building. Um, and so essentially from this line forward would be that new construction, and from this line backward is kind of the more renovated part of the structure. Um, so, so, you know, we, we, re um, we received the preliminary kind of suggested design from JLR, um, their kind of national account. And, um, you know, they're going for, it, it is a modern design, um, but we, um, so essentially to just describe what that is, is basically from my laser here down, that flat roof is um, what their proposed design is. And we said, well, we read the Scarborough uh, design standards and said, well, that's really not allowed or encouraged at all. So we, what we're proposing is to try to, um, uh, introduce the more vernacular gable form onto their structure. So it's really trying to work with their design standard, but also our design guideline, but um, meld that with the local design standards of Scarborough. Um, so we are proposing to add these uh, gable forms to make it a little bit more vernacular feel um, and, and more of a vernacular roof form. Um, we do have uh, some renderings here. So this kind of shows the proposal. So. Um, this would be facing Route 1 with the, um, a bit of parking in front and then the showroom um, and then the gables, basically the two, two kind of uh, branded sides. It's all one building interconnected with the Jaguar and then the Land Rover. Um, you can see the pylon sign here, um, which would be in the location and size that it is now. It's just going to be um, updated. Um, one of the, one of the I, going through the staff comments, one of the questions was what is that going to look like? And basically, um, it will be the same color cladding material, which is a metal panel, um, as, the, as the building. So it'll be an integrated kind of all cohesive design. Um, this is a rendering kind of looking at the side of the building. So this is kind of the new construction, the existing kind of service bay with the overhead doors. Um, and then again, the, the kind of brand design and then our kind of um, uh, additional gable forms on the roof um, to respond to the design standards. Um, Here's kind of a, just a, a picture of the um, uh, kind of the signage of the building, their standard. So this shows you the pylon sign, again, the same color material. Um, there are, you know, various uh, signage uh, requirements. Um, one, another item in the staff comments was about the uh, existing building mounting lighting. Um, at this point, we're proposing to basically remove and replace or, or reinstall that. It, it was done within the last, I think, uh, five years. Um, but that will be color matched to the siding it's mounted on. So the idea is that it's still the cutoff fixture, but it'll match the siding so it doesn't jump out. Um, and then the other um, piece that's kind of lit is there's this existing, or not existing, a proposed um, halo sign. So it's basically the, the logos which you saw on, uh, on the elevations. Um, it has kind of a halo lit letter. So it's not like, it's not 
space lit, but it's kind of a lit on the sides of the letter, so it does it does um, l light up at night to provide lighting and, and some signage, <coughs> but it's not kind of in your face like a uh, backlit sign. Um, and so those are kind of the, the slides um, that we're presenting. So the, the last item that Jay had mentioned, um, we are proposing um, a metal panel um, exterior um, to the building and um, would, would request that that be incorporated into the, the contract zone language as um, uh, Jay said it's frowned upon and, and prohibited in the zone. Um, I would like to point out that this panel is a very high quality metal panel. This, we're actually doing it on a project uh, in Portland now and it's uh, a, a very durable and kind of clean look and I think, it'll, I think it'll look great. It'll look sharp and crisp and I don't want you to kind of have the impression of a metal panel like that kind of corrugated panel you see a lot. I mean this is a very clean, crisp uh, material with nice clean reveals. Um, and uh, it'll be a real classy look. So um, again, it's the brand standard, but I mean, I, I truly believe it is a very uh, kind of um, stately and, and, uh, and uh, durable material. Um, and so that's kind of the, uh, the, the presentation. Um, and and uh, if you have any questions, we're, we're uh, here to answer them. Thank you. I don't think we have any uh, anyone out there who wants to come up for public comment, but <laughs> sure. <laughs> sure. <laughs> want to get in on this? All right. Um, Mike, do you want to? Sure. Start off. You know, you know what would have been helpful for me is if you gave me a current condition uh, photo, because I'm trying to. I mean, I drive by it often, and I've been to, I've been to uh, to the store. Yeah. But I don't recall what that material is that ex the current. Uh, sure. Exterior material. Can we, you tell we me? Did, we brought it last, not last time, to the council, and we forgot, uh, forgot oh. to bring it tonight. But it's um, it's a very geometrically kind of complex facade, but and the, there's quite a few colors. The, the green on the Land Rover side, and then um, kind of the more there's like a rounded turret right. on the Jaguar right. side. But so what's the material? Um, it's it's a mix of some metal panel and like stucco and okay. a little of everything. It's the masonry on the bottom, so I thought there was some metal in it. Yeah. Um, <coughs> aesthetically, uh, design guidelines aside, just for a second, aesthetically, I think this, this does look very nice. I think it cleans up the um, the current condition, in my view, anyway. It's very subjective, obviously, but I like I like the clean, crisp lines, I, the openness of it all also. Um, when we talk about uh, metal metal panels on buildings being prohibited, um, I'm sure all of us uh, know where the rock and roll diner is. And when I made when <laughs> I made a comment about the uh, the metal issue with that, um, we kind of discussed the the uh, the periodness of it all, you know. So we do have that latitude, and um, and I think most people would agree we should have that latitude. In this case, I would be okay with um, with this kind of material as you presented it, um, and I do appreciate you adding the gable um, gable front uh, facade to it because uh, I, I'm sure that um, Jaguar and Land Rover and uh, all these other dealerships, they, McDonald's, all the, all of them, they've run into a lot of issues trying to come up to some corporate design that they want to install throughout the United States, but. Um, they're aware that every community uh, might want to put its own little um, code to it also. So I'm sure they're fine with this as, as well. But So I think you've, you've added to, uh, to their design, I think, quite nicely. Um, the landscaping looks good. Uh, everything looks good to me. Uh, the fact that you're getting rid of that, um, that what did you call it, a rock um, hill? Yeah, the rock track. The rock track. Uh, I actually like that. I like the fact that you're getting rid of it because I think that um, it cleans up the site as well. I, I do have to note, though, and I think last time Jaguar was in front of us, which was probably several years ago, it still seems to me that um, there's this um, overwhelming um, want and need to park the display vehicle outside the, the lines of where they're allowed in the contract zone. Um, I think right now this, the new Jaguar SUV is parked outside those lines. <laughs> it's a beautiful car. Um, you can't miss it. <laughs> and if I had one, I'd put it right in front of my house as well. But um, 
I think I think you need to just uh, ask uh, Mr. Goodwin to, you know, go back and you know take a look at his contract zone and where where it's allowed where he's where he's parked. And and this might be actually a great opportunity for maybe he wants to explore areas that he didn't explore the first time we did the contract zone and and introduce other areas that he wants to display vehicles. And then we could talk. Oh, the town council can talk about that. But currently there is some minor. I'll, I'll call it minor violations. But uh, uh, what you presented uh, tonight, I like it. I like the uh, the subdued lighting on the on the uh, the signage that you uh, the halo you called it on the side there. You called it a halo, I think. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I like I like that kind of lighting too. So I think it's a very stately uh, look, and I think it would um, improve the uh, site as it exists today. So I'm uh, looking forward to seeing it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks. Susan. Um. <coughs> I am very glad to be seeing, I call it the rock, <laughs> leaving. That's really great. Um, just make sure that you bring us the materials that you're thinking about changing to. I don't have any real problems with changing the design as long <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> and appreciate your willingness to come into a closer um, coordination with our design standards. Um, Oh, these are the colors. Yeah, the okay. The, the signage is going to be important. And I thank Michael for bringing that up in terms of sticking to the proper display areas. I have this little game that I play with myself because I go down Route 1 a lot. Okay, day number 12 in a row that, that there's a display in the wrong place. When it first happened way back with this, I know I shouldn't admit this, but when this passed the um, board and you got your approvals, I went in and talked to people about it. <laughs> <laughs> I was very bold. You really aren't supposed to be parking there. Oh, really? And after my fourth visit, I just gave up. Nobody cared but me. And, you know, I was making a scene. But I think something needs to be done about that, and this might be a time to take it on. And thank you for saying that, Michael. I don't feel quite so strange. I have no problems with this in general. I'm looking forward to the details, and um, good luck. Thank you, Roger. Um, I have, I have, I think everything looks fine. I have no problem with anything. Oh boy! Thank you. Um, I also agree with my fellow board members that this uh, this looks like a, a nice, clean look, and there's, um, you know, it may not be a lot of a lot of metal on the existing facade, but there is kind of a lot going on there, um, and. Um, I also agree it would be nice to, to get rid of the get rid of the rock and kind of clean things up generally. Um, I think on, on terms of the exterior cladding material, it, it would be helpful if you could bring a sample of that um, when you come back, just to kind of help give us if that's if that's feasible to help give us the kind of are these just the colors or the oh that is the material that is I'm sorry okay yeah. I thought I thought these were just uh, yeah and if I may the sketches of the Present, bring back pr sketches of the present material. Existing conditions. The existing conditions. Right, yeah. right, for comparison purposes. Okay. And I did, um, I had a thought similar to, to Mike uh, j just before the meeting, and I go by there all the time too, like all of us do. But after a while, certain things, you know, you just don't see them anymore. But I had the thought as I was on my way to the meeting that I'm, I don't remember exactly what that existing condition looks like, so I had to make a point of going by there. Um, I think it would be helpful just for comparison purposes. And so that is that's a, why a they suggestion. Yeah. Right. <laughs> you kind of forget what it looks like. <laughs> sure. Um, and, uh, yeah, so I'm I also happy with the landscaping. Um, you know, it's got a little bit of a recurring theme tonight around contract zones and, oh, and yes. those sort of being a two-way street, and so I appreciate my like it's Susan bringing up the sort of minor violations, if you will. Um, I know you're not the owner, but I'm sure that'll we find, it, find its way back. Um, and I think, you know, it's just, uh, again, not to belabor the point too much, but, um, you know, I'm not a huge fan of contract zones either. Um, they do have their advantages, but um, I think that with some of these special uh, accommodations that are negotiated, they really are negotiated ultimately, um, like any negotiated deal, uh, an agreement, that, you know, both sides need to be honored. And so I think 
um, we need to, need to be very attentive as a town to making sure that there's follow through on that regardless of what this, what the site is so um, but again I look forward to seeing this uh, again next time in more detail assuming it comes back and I will uh, put a motion forward I move to approve the preliminary site plan application of ENF limited liability company LLC for the building addition and associated site improvements at the Land Rover Jaguar site at 371 US Route 1 as proposed in materials submitted on their behalf by Sebago Technics. This preliminary approval shall be considered a favorable opinion to the Council in consideration of the contract zone amendment. The Board recommends the Council consider adopting a modification of the contract zone language allowing for the use of contemporary building materials, metal, on the primary facade of the structure as such materials are otherwise prohibited on this site. Upon Council adoption of the contract zone modifications, the applicant shall revise the site plans in accordance with staff comments and board discussion for final review and approval. Second. We have a second. Any further discussion? If I might just point out for discussion purposes, uh, I note that um, in, in the way this was phrased, that the board recommends council consider adopting modification of the language to allow contemporary building materials right. metal on the primary facade. I only identify primary facade because that's what the design standards really talk about is the restriction of using them. So I just want to be sure staff recognizes that the applicant's proposing use it on all sides of the building, but um, just for a point of clarification in case there was any concern on the applicant's app or board app on that. Okay. Thank you for that. And I, I, I just noted that <coughs> under draft motion it says lands are over. It should say <laughs> land rover. <laughs> all, right. <laughs> all right. Any further discussion? All in favor? That's, that's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Look. Oh my goodness. Do we have any? <laughs> Uh, yep, just one item to report. Just, uh, I believe we touched on this at the last meeting, but um, at this point, about half the trees with our canopy grant have been installed, um, particularly at as you come off 295 on the right hand side there before you get to uh, Green Acres intersection. Mm -hmm. um, then there was a few also in the Oak Hill area. Um, we have a few more to go, but um, things are underway. And, and it's wonderful. Coming along. It's really Fair great. Yeah. Yeah, which the medians are done. So the medians? I know that's a different program, yeah, but, but yeah. It's when it all kind of comes together. <coughs> it's a success story. Absolutely. Decades in the making. Decades in the <laughs> making, yes. That's it. All right. Do we have an administrative amendment report? Nothing to report. Okay. It can't be for the board. Right. <laughs> I mean, just in the way we sort of did that. Any planning board correspondence? Planning board comments. Yes, Roger. Uh, I just want to revisit the whole contract zone thing again, because I think Must what we? was, because I think what, I think it was kind of important what came up tonight, and um, I don't know whether the town has a mechanism. I know we have a building inspector who goes out and periodically checks things to make sure everything's being done according to ordinances and zoning and everything like that, and I think, uh, I think it's worthwhile revisiting whether there's follow-up on the part of the town to make sure that certain things are being uh, followed, you know, at a certain intervals of time. Because I can, I can see where, just like the uh, Land Rover thing with parking the vehicle, uh, and frankly we saw it at the last meeting with one of the other applicants with their parking, you know, uh, and that wasn't, a, that wasn't a contract zone, but this slippage <coughs> does occur over time. So right. I think it's worth, I mean, no sense in trying to get people aggravated if we can avoid it. So. Mm -hmm. Well, the thing, if I can add to that, too, is, uh, I mean, most folks have the opportunity to go online. And um, it seems to me that what we heard tonight, there's, there's, a, there's a, a lot of anxiety. And uh, the contract zone that specific to that actual use, that, that uh, uh, to to um, Mercedes and to Land Rover, to all the content, they're actually they're written right in the mm -hmm. uh, right in the um, in the uh, zoning ordinance that you can see online. Mm -hmm. 
I know if it was me, I would be looking at that to my right and looking out my window to my left, and I'd be writing down every violation that I saw, and I would be, be bringing it to the attention of the town. You know, so it, in some ways, I know that it, it can be argued whether contract zone is good or bad, but like I said earlier, it's good in that it seems to me it's tighter. It can be tighter. If it's written well, then it can be enforced. Uh, it seems to me it's much more black and white than if you find that someone's violating the use of a particular zone. It just seems. In addition to that, I mean, that site was a controversial site to start with. Sure. And I bet you anything, almost every abutter understands what the conditions are of that contract zone. You know? Um, yeah, any abutter that had been there for 20 years or so. Right, yeah. I mean, and it was originally, I think originally after that uh, construction, was it Ashland or something? Yeah. That was there. Um, I think it was going to be a Wendy's or a McDonald's or something. That's, that's right, yeah. <clears throat> and I think that. Yeah, I'm done. Thank you. <clears throat> Sorry. If I may. <clears throat> Part of what we heard tonight, I think, is um, discomfort with feeling as if they're not being heard. And that isn't our problem. It is a problem. I don't want to make it sound like it's not a problem. It's an issue. And we get to this point in Scarborough occasionally. But I do agree that the information that people need to know that there is a, a problem is available to them. And if they're not getting the kind of um, response that they feel they deserve, <clears throat> then they really have a council thing. They really do need to come to the council because that's something about how the town is operating. I agree. Agreed. Thank mm. you. Okay. Anything else? No. Motion to adjourn. Second that motion. All in favor? Thank you. Motion to adjourn. Yeah. I'm in. Okay, right. Yeah. But they were out.